What was going on at the Asifo house last night? These guys are tired. They're drained. They're not ready to go. We didn't start. Right. Recording that. We didn't start recording until you like you were halfway into that. So go ahead. Yeah. Again. No, I know. I was just saying. What's going on at the Asifo house? These guys are tired. They're drained. They're covered in in visceral fluids. I I honestly don't want to know. I don't want to know. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Frankly, <laughs> oh, Jeremy's smiling. You're, they had an orgy. They definitely had an orgy. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're a Christian yeah. podcast. That's the next logical decision. <laughs> the next listen, logical listen. step. We were, we were a Christian podcast. Now I think we should revert to a pagan podcast uh, yes. in honor of my Roman ancestors. And I, Mike and Jeremy celebrated that with an orgy last night. Uh, boys, how was the orgy? I'm not even going to dignify that was a response. <laughs> yeah. Okay. David, how do you think the orgy went? Sweatily. Sweaty, a lot of sweat, yeah, a lot of passion. Sounds, sounds very sweaty. A lot of, <laughs> a lot of, passion. a lot of wet slaps, like it sounded like someone beating up a turkey. And I think it's even funnier because I'm pretty sure these guys come from like a pretty religious family too. So, um. oh, a huge religious home. <laughs> You should have seen the argument we had yesterday about me not going to church because I'm going to work that t- t- um, today. Oh my god! <laughs> you just had the argument you not going to church because you're 25. And an adult. <laughs> yes, David. Yes. Not, not in an African household. Oh man. You're not an adult god. until you pay your own bills. Oh my god. Oh my man. God. Why have you not gone to church? You know you need the salvation of Jesus Christ. What oh, are you doing? What you are know you what? Doing? African accents actually getting kind of better. Yo, you're working on it, man. You think him and you think him and um oh sorry, should I say your name? I'll bleep that out. Anyway, you think him and his girl like practice they're like all right stefano take it back from the top and he's like all right yeah, three sounds like that is funny yeah man i pull out i pull out that african that that garb that colorful garb from the uh, from the closet i'm like all right let's get some practice and okay i gotta be at least 10 percent better than i was for the last podcast that is so <laughs> funny. Ten percent. that's my cultural, model i wonder What's how your that? other like cultural accents are and if you pull those out i've, I've heard them. my they're my white no, my white ones are pretty good. I got a good Eastern European accent. Really? Funny. I got a good Scottish accent. Okay, um, let's hear your Scottish accent. Uh, I'm a fan of You know Scottish. David's from Scotland, right? Yeah, I used to live there. But anyway, go on. Okay, all right. You goddamn Brits coming over here, taking all of our water. What do you think you're doing up in Glasgow? Okay. All right. <laughs> That's not bad. <laughs> That's not bad. Not quite Glasgow. You shouldn't Scottish that. and Irish and some yeah. Australian in there, like it's very North it's a, Irish, Northern Irish. Listen, listen, it's it's a it's a pish posh, okay? It it comes from a place of deep cultural understanding. You know, I couldn't leave on my Northern Irish. Can we get to the fight? Can we <laughs> get right, to the fight, right, please. Podcast, like, okay, like, this is the Light Kick podcast. If you didn't know, so we are an MMA and sports podcast. Ooh, we're gonna talk some Raptors. Whoa. Ooh, yeah. Let's go Raptors. Let's go Raptors. Oh, okay. Story time. I like, Actually, I like this we, energy. I like this energy today. Can we save the story time? I'm gonna for story time. I'm gonna talk about the time I was in Mexico and the Let's Go Raptors chat broke out in Mexico. That happened, but we'll, we'll get. To, yeah. Oh, I have a I have a basketball yeah, story. I, surprisingly, I have a basketball story from Cuba as well. But it's, uh, I don't know. Can we do a back to back story time if we have time? Sure. Before? Let's do it. Um, we we gonna get into the news first. Yes, yes, there's, yes. There's a couple of very big fight announcements. Johnny Walker's got a fight. Um, yeah. Our boy got a Tanner fight. Bozer has a fight. Oh, for real? Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. All right. Let's let's start with the, the like. Let's start light. Um, one championship had their first event since shutdown. Man, I wanted to watch that. Yeah, and oh, go back and watch it. Yodson Clive versus Patch Morikot. Yeah. It was it, some some great fights on there. Oh, Yarkin's a side fight. He lost. Um, but Pet, it was Petch Morikot's a beast, man. He had those that, that those two fights with uh, the best Muay Thai fighter in the world, Giorgio Petrosian, the perfect the the, the, the surgeon, the perfect Italian uh, Muay Thai fighter. But uh, yeah. I think Jake Hagerty is better, but whatever. Well, well, well his, uh, his his record definitely does not speak to that. But um, <laughs> if. But, if there's one thing I love about one championships, I don't know about you guys, it's Muay Thai and four ounce gloves. Yeah. 
I think that's such a great idea. You really see the difference in how guys approach fighting when their gloves are smaller in Muay Thai. Um, they're a lot more movement oriented, a lot more kind of technical in, you know, kicking, punching, and then transitioning into a clinch. It's not just kind of brawling in your way into it, right? It's a lot more. But anyway. Yeah, um, in in, uh, in four ounce gloves, the cover up and uh, cover up and trade doesn't exactly work as well, right? But yeah. it's great. I think as much as you know, Chari Sit Yudon can be a bit sketchy, and one championship's probably not going to be around for a long time, seeing as they're a hundred million dollars in debt. Um, what they have done very well. Yes, Mike. I'm uh, David. I see you making that face. There was a, light there's, work. Light uh, work. Light who work. Who cares? Whatever, they'll, they'll, they'll solve that. I, I, I want one championship to succeed. So I do, too. Oh, I do, too. I do, too. And I think one of the reasons is um, taking these Thai fighters with that have 300 fights that are some of the best combat athletes in the world and giving them a platform for the world to see. Like, hey, Yod Sinclai, Petsch Morikot, Rod Tang. You know, Rod Tang is so, so good. Rod Tang, Rod Tang is so The good. Iron Man. Come on. Oh, my God. But, yeah, no, I remember on Patrick from York Muay Thai – was like, hey, who do you have in these fights? I was like, I'm going to be honest with you. I even know one championship was back. And then I watched all these fights, albeit spoils for me, because one championship has their has um, spoils the event for you because the Asian audience gets to see it first, and then you do. Um, and I saw these fights. And my God, um, let me just say, first off, Stamp Fairtex, you know, this 22-year-old girl out of, out of um, uh, Thailand, let me tell you something. A couple more MMA fights, and I and she's in the UFC. I'm telling you, she's going to – if she can make 115 because she's in atom weight right now, if she can – if her body fills out as she gets older and she makes it to – and she gets up to 115, she can be something. She can be something. So, yeah. Hey, yeah. yeah. Wow, her, man. Her, her strength of competition, you know, other than Asha Roka, I don't know uh, which – you know, I, I'm not familiar with a lot of her opponents. I'm not. I'm qu- not questioning her. Okay, I guess I'm questioning her strength of competition a little bit. Yeah, no, I know. But I, I, I honestly, I, I honestly think you get some punch matches every once in a while. Yeah, I think one championship is a good fit for her though, because they can give her frequent matchups, multiple weight classes, multiple disciplines. Um, I think it's difficult. Uh, that the jump from atom weight to straw weight is significant, man. And you see elite level fighters like, or. <sighs> I'm, I'm okay. Uh, let me walk that back. You see, very talented fighters like uh, the Karate no, Hottie Michelle. I think, Michelle I, think, I think strawweight is probably the strongest division, like name for name, in in women's fighting right now. Oh, I agree. That's why I'm saying that jump from atom weight to strawweight is a big one. Where like Michelle Watterson, who could be a champion at atom weights, meanwhile, you know, bumps up to strawweight and she's a contender, but doesn't she's okay? Her yeah. 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 Yeah, no, I hear that. But I think Stamp, like, she's 22 years old, and she's already got all the technique in the world, right? So, I, you know, I, I mean, for all we know, she could turn into Tenshin Nasakawa, right? But Yeah, yeah, that's a fair point. But, you know, she's she's young, and she, she's got a whole bunch of fights, a whole whack of fights, and she's for real. So, um, yeah, anyway, that was one championship news. Um Let's get into some of these fighter announcements. Sorry, I just wanted to jump in and say that that was the most hardcore segment um, we've ever done. (laughs) (laughs) Jeremy and I were just looking at each other like, what? (laughs) All right. um, Oh, my God, there's a lot of fights. Yeah, we're, we're we're talking about obscure weight classes and parts of the world that most people aren't even familiar with. Yeah, man. Right. Now let's talk about An Neil Song. <laughs> <No. Yeah. laughs> the hey, the Burmese Python, man. I'm a big fan. I'm a big... <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Burmese was that, that from Dodgeball? No, the, the no you know how he does post? this thing? You know how he does Oh this yeah, thing. that's right. That's right. Right? He fell in Vera in his last fight. Yeah, yeah. Um uh, but but, but yeah, Mike, let's get into these announcements. Um, oh my goodness, there's there's a whole lot. Do you guys want me to start little and then go big, or do you yeah. guys want me to go? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So probably the I think the lesser lesser cared one overall, but probably one that's close to my heart is Tanner Bulldozer Bozer has a fight. I want to try to get him on the show. If Tanner, if you're listening, we're we're coming for you to come on the show. Um, <laughs> but the Light Kick podcasts, we're we're big fans of Tanner Bozer here at the yeah. Light Kick, and we're rooting for you in any way. But guess who he's fighting, guys? This is actually a pretty big step up in competition. Get, 
Oh, yes. Andre Arlovsky. That's right. He's yeah. going to be facing off against Andre Arlovsky. Oh. I think October 3rd, I hear. Um, but that, I might be wrong on that one. But, yeah, he's got a fight. Respect. That's, that's a great matchup. Um, Andre is showing that he's still very much um, capable. Very much capable in the, the later stages of his career. Maybe not the glass chin that we once thought he, he had, but um, not that I'd like to see him fighting any longer. But that is that is an interesting fight and an interesting step up for um, uh, for our boy Tanner Bozer. Hey, hey, you yes. know what? I think this is probably the one – I would say it's a little higher competition than I wanted. But remember ye- yesterday we talked about, hey, if you wanted Tanner Bozer's next fight, what do you want it to be? Bigger but capable striker. Not like – I wouldn't necessarily say I want to see like him versus like – you know, Francis Ngannou or Rosenstroik, but I said him versus a guy who can be a good striker, but is not as fast, of course, because Tanner's probably the fastest guy in the division. I don't care what anyone says. What? Uh, oh, oh take hand, speed, you. hand speed take. wise? Oh Mike, we're, 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 we're big fans of Tanner Boser at the leg kick. We're also not delusional, okay? Okay, yeah, that's a good point. You know what? I thought, um, I thought, I thought, I thought my list of all the fast guys in the division. I was like, ah, you know what? I'll walk. Oh, you think back. he's you think he's faster than Stipe, Really? Uh, no, yeah. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna walk that one back. <laughs> hey, who do you think we're a bigger fan of? Who do you think we're a bigger fan of the leg kick podcast? Tanner Boser or um, uh, Cyril Gone? Sarah gone because I think that guy can be a champion. Tanner, Tanner Bozer because uh, he can actually, you know, have a conversation with us on this podcast. <laughs> hey, we're not Paul Francais. Shout out to Cyril Gando. Paul Francais? Oh, that's true. This is Canada. Cyril yeah, Gando, if you're be. listening. Um, yeah, Cyril you know. Gando, if you're listening. Just oh, not, but none of us speak French. Je so. parle français. J'habite Ottawa. Come on. It's a real guy. If you're listening, just hey, leave Michael. Jeremy, come on this podcast. Let Jeremy, Taber Calisto, si Tabernacle. Okay. Don't scroll around. I guess have gone so far off the rails. Maybe this you would like a cooling beverage. Okay. Um. So that, what's next as far as matchups? Yeah, uh, the next one I have here is one that, like, honestly, I saw it and I nearly, I, I nearly had a heart attack because I was so amazed. I can't believe this is finally happening. Um, places, everyone, calm down. Zabit versus Yair has been confirmed for August 29th. Anyone who is going to call me to go out that day, I'm not happening. It's not happening. <laughs> don't call me. Don't text. No nothing. Because I'm not coming out. <clears throat> I'm watching this fight. Right. This, this this was such a like no duh kind of matchup that I'm I'm so surprised that in this division it hasn't already been made. It's it's going to be fireworks, man. This is what Bruce Leroy versus uh, Yair Rodriguez should have been. Uh, two tall, lanky guys that throw flashy techniques, going balls to the wall for 15 minutes straight, until one of them gasses out or possibly both of them, and then we have a sloppy third round. I'm so excited for this. <laughs> yeah, no, this seems like a really fun fight. Um, yeah, I, I really don't have any more takes than that. It seems like a really fun fight, and I can't wait to watch it. Is this for a championship or a contender for a championship? I think it's a title eliminator. I Pretty think much. I would yeah, say, it's not a, there's no belt on the line, but... Um, yeah, I would say maybe Korean Zombie is slightly above these two, but, I mean, I don't know. What? Uh, so so they're, Korean Zombie, oh, when are they going to get the winner will probably face uh, Korean Zombie. No, the winner. The winner will face um, uh, Vol- the winner of Volkanovski and Korean Zombie. Right. Okay. You Which, know what? The again, a- of Korean Zombie though. What Brian Ortega has been campaigning hard to fight. Yes, him, so. but he's been inactive for quite a while, and I think Zombies earned his shot. Although I would, I'd still love to see that Ortega match him. I like to see Ortega against anyone, frankly. Right. Yeah. Especially after um, the whole controversy with. Ortega slapping up uh, Mr. Park. Yes, uh, Jae Young Park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, who also was, was a odd. K-pop sensation, by the way, but whatever. That was uh, a very, very odd debacle. But, uh, yeah, great fight. Yeah. Yeah, that's anyway. a weird promo. Man, wow. Okay, so before I mention the big one, does anyone have any fights that, like, I missed? or? Yeah, you missed the Johnny Walker announcement. I forget exactly who he's against. Oh, you also missed the Chris Weidman announcement. Oh, yeah, he's fighting, like, isn't he next week versus Armari? He's fighting Armari Akhmedov, which I think is an interesting matchup because Akhmedov been on a bit of a tear recently, to be honest with you. And um, a dangerous fight for Chris Weidman because it's a step down in in name value, right? Um, 
it doesn't really do anything for his stock if he wins this and if he loses it we're really going to be questioning whether Chris Weidman should be fighting still if we're not already. So I, I mean, it's a, it's a fan that uh, as a hardcore and a big fan of Omar Yakhmedov, I'm salivating over and I want to see what Weidman can do, but it's, it's a difficult one career wise for Weidman. I think. Yeah. Well, the thing about it is I always say this is that when, you know, like when you're, when you're a ranked, a po- like a ranked team in the NCAA, like a basketball team or, or a, a football team, what do you do, right, when you're at the start of the season and you need to get the boys in shape for their matchup? You go and you face a team that's not as good on paper but can still give you a dangerous matchup, right? So, you know, every once in a while, Duke, for example, will come up to Canada, face the Ryersons, face the, you know, fa- face like McMaster, not Carlton because they're scared and they duck them, but whatever. Um, that means you nothing know, what? <laughs> but what? Look, I'm. I'm, j- I'm Do you just saying, really think that? Yeah, I think, Duke was, I think Duke was ducking Carl. Okay, all right. Let's not get bogged but, down in a basketball conversation. Let's hear this metaphor. Okay, no. But the point <laughs> I make is that Chris Weidman is trying to get his confidence back. You know what I'm saying? He's trying to face the lower, some of the lesser guys, get his confidence back, get get some of the things back in tune to go back up and face some of the tougher guys, some of the more name value guys in the division. Right? And I think this is a good, tough, but good confidence builder matchup for him. Um, I'm not necessarily saying it's a lock. I'm not saying necessarily saying he's going to win because Omar Ekmedov can fight his ass off. But I think that if he wins, this is one of those ones that I think you're going to point to as the career resurgence for Chris Weidman. Interesting take. Um, I think I agree with you. We'll see if Weidman's kind of biting off more than he can chew. But uh, I'm, I'm certainly – I'm interested to see how this plays out. Uh, the next one that you missed is Johnny Walker versus Ryan Spann. Ooh, yeah. That's an interesting fight for me. I'm going to pull up Ryan Spann's uh, record here just because he's one of those fighters that I'm familiar with. But um, – It's not as much uh, as you think for the record. It's like 9-0 and 0 or something like that. It's not, it's not a lot of fights. But – does, does anyone feel like, and I know I'm not the first one to come up with this take, but does anyone feel like we real? oh, you beat Sam Elvey. Okay. Hasn't been beaten since Carl Robertson on Dana White's Contender Series in 2017. He's on a bit of a streak. Last Carl Robertson, by Sam the way, is super unprofessional. Did you, missing weight twice in a row. Uh. Well, hold on. Before we go off on that train. Um, yeah, uh, I feel like despite how many fights we've seen Johnny Walker in, We don't really know much about him other than he can get guys out of there very quickly by virtue of being unorthodox and being able to pick up on, um, you know, pick pick up on habits and exploit things, exploit um, opportunities and holes in their opponent's armor very early on. Other than that, as far as his weaknesses over the long run, we don't really know. So I'm never really comfortable picking the result of a Johnny Walker fight. Unless you're my boy Misha Sirkinoff. That that was that was tough. That was, that oh, was tough. Oh, we don't, we don't talk about that here. Yeah, that was tough. <laughs> Man. Okay, Mike, um, let's but yeah, one. Okay. Gaethje versus Habib, October 24th. This is huge. I've been saying this for a this long time. Point. A long time. Even before – sorry, Mike, did you did – you, Mike, do you want to say something? No, no, no. What? Go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> the leg, the leg kick. Ahead. The leg kick brought to you by Awkward Podcast. Oh, awkward yeah. pauses. And... <laughs> um, go ahead. So, no, yeah, sorry. I, I've been saying for a long time that I think Gaethje is the man to beat um, Khabib. A lot of people thought it'd be Ferguson. I think his wrestling, and I've been saying that because I thought his wrestling and the ability for him to push a pace on Khabib and keep him in, in the pocket, sprawl, and get up would present an interesting challenge. But after the Ferguson fight, I'm convinced that he's the man to beat Khabib. With the uh, the ability to circle the cage and remain in the center that he showed against Tony Ferguson, how sophisticated his footwork will, um, looked and how he was able to pay make Tony pay and stop his forward pressure consistently, I think, and I'm not saying Khabib can't win this, I think this is a nightmare matchup for him. All good points, but I don't think Gaethje can win this any way but a decision. 
What? I really don't think so because Gaethje has the one thing, and that is his wrestling defense. But Khabib's wrestling acumen is far, well, not far, but it's better than Gaethje. So his takedowns are better than Gaethje's. Gaethje's not going to take down Khabib. Khabib will take down Gaethje. But his takedown defense is, is what's going to save him, and his his striking and his footwork is what's going to help him survive till the end. But I do believe that the only way Gaethje will win this is to survive. Here's here's where I disagree uh, with you yeah, thoroughly on that, Jeremy, that. because I, I agree with you in the sense that I think Khabib's wrestling is better than Gaethje's significantly, especially his offensive wrestling. At the same time, wrestling and mixed martial arts, it's different from let's put on our singlets and, uh, you know, roll around for five minutes. If Gaethje can keep Khabib outside of a range where he's comfortable, he can finish him. I, that's my thing is that Gaethje has finishing power. Like it's not – if this isn't, you know, Michael Johnson, right, where Michael Johnson all of a sudden just had no power left in his hands. Um, this is a guy in Gaethje who shoots to kill. Like, you know, so um, the I, I don't – sorry, go ahead. No, no, keep going, sorry. No, I was going to say – um, yeah, I can see Gaethje finishing Habib with, you know, maybe a straight left, maybe a follow up with a left straight right, maybe a follow up with a left hook. Um, but I do, I think Jeremy, Jeremy, where Jeremy's head is at, I kind of like the idea that, you know, look, we've, we've seen power punchers against Habib. What happened? Connor, you know, Connor had, did Connor have finishing power? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. But Connor's not sure. Justin too, right? Like, yeah, that- it's weird. Right. I think I do like where Jeremy's head is at, though. I do think that it's it's where that's the the question and the conundrum. Right. Can Justin Gaethje scathe off Habib's wrestling long enough to do what he wants to do? Right. The answer is probably no. Um, I agree that Justin probably has better striking um, than Khabib. I think probably probably. No, probably. Probably, I mean, I don't know, because we've never even seen Khabib's, like, full striking arsenal yet, um, because he just doesn't need to show it. He His striking is pretty much to set up the takedown. Um, the question is, if Justin's takedown defense is the real deal, then we're most likely going to get a striking match, which favors Justin. But that's kind of what we said for Conor McGregor, although I think Justin Gaethje has way more credentials when it, and just more tape. In, term, in evidencing his strong wrestling defense in Connor. Um, the, for me, I, th- I think it's going to play out into a grappling match, realistically, because I don't think Khabib is going to want to stand and strike with somebody who has a little bit of an advantage and heavy hands. Like That just seems like a bad game plan to me. So it's probably going to devolve into a grappling match. And in a grappling match, I'm always going to MMA, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Sambo, wrestling. I'm always going to favor Khabib. So, yeah. Can, can I say one more thing to this? Because I, I do think you raised some very valid points. And I mean, clearly, what does Khabib, 26 and 0? Yeah. 28. 28, 28 and 0. Like, you know, I'm 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 not going to say I, I know it with 100% certainty because 28 have tried, 28 have come fallen short. But if I had to lay evidence to my claim that I think Gaethje would win, I'd, uh, first of all, comparisons to Connor and power striking, uh, power punching. That's kind of where I think the similarity is at. Connor's prone to fading over the long run. He's not one who's necessarily known to stick to a game plan over five rounds, right? Uh, and he's prone to exhaustion. Uh, I think I think Justin Gaethje's also very different kinds of strikers. Connor's yeah. much more, I'm going to pressure you to the fence, pick at you, and then leap back for, with my counter left hand. Whereas... Gaethje, as as much as we saw a different, um, a different Gaethje in the Ferguson fight, he's much more about pressure. Uh, get to the low kick early, and you know. Yeah, the way I see it, Connor is a counter striker. Um, Gaethje's more of a pressure fighter, and Khabib's a pressure fighter, but just more of a grappler rather than a striker. So it's going to be interesting. The one thing with Gaethje is that I know he gets like his uh, strike. Both like his strikes per minute and his strikes absorbed per minute are both really high because he evolves into brawls a lot of the time. Um, you live by the sword, die by the sword. Yeah, Conor McGregor's. A di- I agree, he's a different kind of striker. So I don't know it's how it's gonna me, play out. 
I just don't see Khabib brawling. Like, that just doesn't sound well, Khabib like... Well, Khabib, Khabib won't brawl, but if you recall Gaethje's past three or four fights, he's Gaethje's not so not much brawling a, either. He's not a brawler anymore, no. And <laughs> what, what gives me confidence in the result for Gaethje is, if you remember the Barbosa fight, Khabib was able to hunt him down, but he wasn't cutting the cage very sophisticatedly. He's kind of just following his opponents, which, you know, it, it works until it doesn't, right? I it's, think a, fairness, it's a potential though, weakness. It's a potential yeah, fairness, weakness. though. Like, I think by that point, Edson Barbosa was held at – like, again, I I think Edson Barbosa – I always say this when I get a chance. I didn't – up until that moment, I was like, I don't see any reason why Edson Barbosa can't be a champion in the UFC. And then he looked like he was being held at gunpoint for all of his money when Habib stood across from him in the cage. It, it was – so I think Habib was just so, like – What's the word? He just had his was bullying him so much and was and, I, and I like was get, so in shock. I don't like to get into the whole mental game, even though I do think it's a part of fighting. But like you guys as fighters, you're not going to tell me that, oh, you looked across the stage and somebody was just so intimidating that you like. So I, I, I wouldn't I go mean, that far. I just think at, that like po- at this point thing in my career, thing. pardon and at this point in my career, no, but like you never know, right? Like, yeah, I've I've never run into someone where I'm about to fight where I'm like, you know, yeah, oh no, I'm, but but I'll I'll say this, uh, I've looked into most of my opponent's eyes in, in the stare down. Usually, I can tell what how hard of a fight it's going to be. Like, sure, Anthony, Anthony Joseph and the first couple before that, I looked into your their eyes and I'm like, you're done. Like, I yeah. I'm going to be able to get you out of there very quickly. Cole, when I looked in his eyes, I'm like, well, this man's not back. <laughs> like, I, I couldn't I couldn't detect the quit in his eyes. I'm like, this, I'm, I am in for, I'm in for a long night, which could admittedly be hindsight, but I'm. And, and this is a question for another time, because it's kind of based on our ty- Tyson, uh, Mike Tyson conversation last time. But do you think that all professional fighters have that inner fighter in them? Or do you think that some are just professional athletes? Some are just professional athletes. You can. I think so. Yeah, I think so. And I think there's evidence that that there are some who are not necessarily fighters, but athletes who have succeeded in, you know, in spite of the fact that they don't have that fighter in them. And it always gets kind of dicey when we try and decide who those are, Mm. right? Because it's you know you never want to point the finger and say hey say, this guy's a quitter like Ty, you know. Ty, not even a quitter but just not a, like hey Tyron Woodley you're not a fighter you're just a high level athlete and I think that's one that a lot of people have cited I'm not oh. saying I agree with it I'm right. not saying I agree with it or even think there's ev- there's it's a valid claim but yeah. fair enough yeah it just it's just a weird thought because yeah uh, some people believe the fight is born in you some people are like you could train and get better I don't know I think it's probably a combination of both but yeah yeah I was wondering. Yeah. I don't. I don't think. I think. I do truly think, though, if we had to say, I think it's it's a nurture rather than nature kind of thing. But you know. Um, yeah, now, because I feel like say, every right? human quits. You know, like every human, not everybody, yeah, but, when faced with adversity, is like automatically in like naturally. Dude, wired. My my saying is always some pe- everyone thinks they're a Naruto and then they get proven to be a Sakura. Like that is my like anime saying. Yeah. You know. Right. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but yes, no, I agree. Every, like, I, I know what you mean. I know yeah, what you mean. Every oh, anime fan knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, Jeremy, but, go watch some anime. No, I've watched Naruto. <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about. I've watched Naruto. I just don't use it in conversation. <laughs> I thought all black people loved anime. Blame him. Love love him. Love I, I thought, I thought right. hey, am I, am I not wrong? All, all black people love anime. A lot of black people do. A lot of yeah, it's people. insane. That yeah. surprised me. That surprised me when I found that out. I'm like, yeah, hey, black me too. Like anime? Yeah, no, surprised me RDC too. World One, like I think, exposed us. We were like, yeah, he caught us. Like yeah. RDC. <laughs> so uh, now that uh, any any more fight announcements, any more news? No. Anyone pop? Anyone pop for for penis pills from a gas station again? Or no. <laughs> Imagine. Uh, just really quickly, Mayweather, sorry, McGregor potentially hints at Pacquiao bout with two. Oh, stop. Oh, stop. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, never mind. Let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> Are we, <laughs> bro? If, uh, if, See, when he first, started covering honestly, when he first said I accept, with, huh? when he first said I accept, I thought he meant Tony Ferguson. I was like, oh my god, places, places, everyone, and then. They said Manny Pacquiao, and I was like, oh. Manny Pacquiao, I watched Manny Pacquiao versus Keith Thurman uh, the other day. 
he might be one of the best, might be, hot take, he is one of the best boxers in our lifetime. Like, it's yeah. honestly, like, yeah. From well, David, dis- David, this just in, David rediscovers the wheel. Like, really? <laughs> shake the room, shake the guys, room. Guys, 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 look, I invented fire, like. <laughs> I know, whoa, that Pacquiao- guy invented fire with that take was so hot. I don't know where Michael went. I don't know where Michael went. In other news. Oh, there he is. Uh, Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Yeah, no, so do you want to start getting into some of these fights then, since we're not going to talk about McGregor and his Pacquiao bout? No, absolutely not. We're not going to talk about McGregor's Twitter feed, which, like, (laughs) pay attention to it. We're not going to be one of those MMA podcasts that starts speculating based on based on cryptic tweets. If that was the case, then like if McGregor, so you, got, uh, you know, because you know Pacquiao can box, but McGregor David, if you start, if you say the word MMA angles, I'm going to die of a stroke right here. On the he, front he front. gives different looks, you know. All right, yeah, different right. looks, different looks. Okay. Um. Uh, wow. Uh, kill me. <laughs> okay, I really want to talk Raptors versus Lakers. So can we please like let's talk okay, the fight? Do you want to go top down or bottom up? Um, top down, top down. Top down. Yeah. Right. yeah. So Brunson uh, versus Shabazian. First of all, the hot take for this, and where's Jeremy by the way? But the um, hot take for this one is late stoppage. No. Um, yeah. Okay. Here's what I would say about the stoppage. It was um, it was an odd stoppage. I'm gonna say that uh, it's difficult to. to I, I, I into the bell. Like uh, I think a comparable here is Adesanya versus Whitaker because remember round number one, Whitaker gets kind of flatlined right a bit, and then goes to the corner to recover, and then gets flatlined again. It so, was, but that was like a it was a little bit different. This was like repeated shots like. On Towards the ground, the end. yeah, totally. yeah, as opposed to like you know a flash knockdown kind of thing. So yeah, I, it was it was an odd it was an Ooh, awkward stoppage. I got one and more. I think, Seth, go on, no, go on. Before you go on, I just want also I've, I don't know why I'm in a wormhole on Twitter, but there's a conspiracy about this being emblematic of uh, Herb Dean's bad refereeing, and that he actually waved the fight off after the bell went off. So basically, he lands that last clean shot. It's like a left to the chin, and then Herb steps in basically to pull them apart and looks at him and then waves his hand in front of him. And then yeah. he's like, Oop, didn't mean to do that. First first of all, I, I don't know why you guys always, when I make criticism of Herb Dean, want to like hero worship him as this hey, reverend hey. god. Not Herb. I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not saying. <laughs> he's not Dan Hardy. Okay. Hey, Dan Hardy is the man. Okay. That being said, Herb Dean, get your stuff together, man. It was a, okay, it was a weird stoppage. I'll say this, I'm glad in the third round that it was stopped when it was, in the way that it was. Um, and I think we're definitely helped in kind of making a call on the stoppage by there not being any fans, because the announcers heard themselves. I think it was, um, it might have been Paul Felder who said, that's not, you know, yeah. that's that, not the protest of a man who wants to go on to be a world champion in that like it didn't seem like he wanted to be in that fight at that moment which i mean who can who can blame edmund shabazian he was yeah he just got elbowed in the face three times he flat, over he was flatlined yeah yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't necessarily say it was a bad stoppage just because it's like you're you're at the bell it's like three two one and at the one Derek brunson landed the flatline shot at the I, one so I that's, I like guess, if huh? you rewatch it uh, I said, I said, mike, if he dies, mike if he dies he dies in sequel no, <laughs> no, but my, my, my point is, is that like, it's one of those weird, like you're in the moment, you get one chance to look at it. We don't have instant replay in, in, in fighting, by the way. So it's not like you get the chance to go, oh, he went up here. Okay. Stop it now. I watched this fight three times and I, and that's when I came to the conclusion, like, oh, he got flatlined in that last, like literally the third time I was like, oh no, he's knocked out here, here. And that's after three times of watching it, r- running it back. And seeing it, right? Um, so I think I sure. don't, sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna ask you who's so who uh is to blame for this? I think the doctor, uh, doctor because yeah, I think the doctor, because the thing is is that like look, when someone gets I wouldn't say I wouldn't necessarily say um Edmund Shabazian was like 
was, you know, it was apparent to be flatlined. But like, I think the doctor has to make a call. You look at his eyes, you look, you ask him if he wants to fight and make a call. You don't talk to him about like the weather that day. But the thing is, from what I saw, the doctor went in there and did what I think looked like an on the spot concussion test, because there's no way you wouldn't do one after somebody takes such a blow like that. Um, and it seems like he, that Ed, Edmund was at a place, uh, like responsive enough that the doctor was comfortable letting him in and out, letting him out. I don't think, you know, he definitely did have a concussion because I literally think his body language changed like in between rounds as soon as like he got up. He wasn't like fresh and like trying to do anything. He had some kind of head trauma. Whether, yeah, yeah, whether it was a concussion or not, it was severe head trauma. For sure, clearly, for sure, for sure. Clearly it was head trauma. Yeah. yeah, but the question is, like, as a doctor who does this with uh, other fighters, then how, you know, what's the line, you know? Like, even if you know he definitely has had trauma, is it enough that he his, like, fighting skills aren't there? That's the question. Um, I just think that, like, when you're dealing with fighting, it's a different game because all of a sudden, what happens? Let me play scenario time for you. What happens if... Shabazzian all of a sudden recovers and has this wonderful third round and knocks Darren Brunson. No, but then all of a sudden people are like, the doctor gave him like three minutes to recover, you know? Yeah, um, Mike, but that's a, you You always go to this point, and I feel like those comebacks are weird exceptions, and we can't no, no, I'm take not the saying, call. I'm like, not saying it in the, in the aspect of the comeback. I'm just saying it in the aspect of the controversy. Remember, Tim Kennedy was being Yo Romero. All of a sudden, Yo Romero gets like, what? What was it? Like an eternity to clean off ice on the ground what remember what i'm talking about and the towel and he had to towel himself off and then sure. he beats you, you, you these are things that fighters get upset about so you know what i'm saying alternate scenario if you're Derek brunson you lose after having the performance of your life in the second round and by the way Derek brunson for as sloppy as he did look had probably the best tactical performance i've ever seen from him right? yes. you know so but can I get into a bit of the technique of this fight before we yeah, keep yeah, yeah, the controversy? Yeah. Because I just wanted to say that, first of all, clearly Shabazian had the plan, and I thought he would exploit the head kick, especially late, which he was doing. But I thought it was genius how he went to the body early and often, not just with the kicks, which were, were thunderous. That left kick kept on coming in under under Brunson's guard. Um, and throwing hands to the body, that, that right hook to the closed side, the kick to the open side, and he was clearly trying to bring those hands down to exploit that head kick later. Um, he says Brunson's chin is way up in the air. Like. Way up in the air. But Brunson, to his credit, would answer back all of those shots, was patient, only charged into clinches when he needed to. Mm-hmm. And, man, um, punching in and out of clinches is a lost art. And Brunson, uh, you know, willing to give up takedowns in the interest of finding strikes willing to give up strikes in the interest of finding takedowns, mixing his ranges together, leaning on Shabazian to exhaust him. Great use of the body lock, great use of, um, you know, double leg takedowns. Um, yeah, I thought tactically, you can you could have some sloppy technical errors in your game, which admittedly keeps a high chin, right? Throws some of his punches a little My too... My biggest pet peeve with him, honestly, sorry to cut you off, is... Go for it. My biggest pet peeve is... Just the, the mechanics in his punching and kicking is just all wrong. Yeah. While debating, he evades with his chin up, which is kind with of weird. With his chin up. Now, that, all that being said, which is true, and those bother me as well, You can ha- clearly you can have fighters at a very high level who fight to a game plan with correct tactics and still have technical errors. Like, what boxing coach would sit you down and tell you to punch like Dominic Cruz? Case in point, right? Do you guys think he won that first round? Because I I don't know who won that first round. I, I thought it was competitive. I thought it was yeah. competitive. Yeah. I'd have to go I, back I, and watch I, it, but I, I, in, the, in the moment, I gave it to Shabazian, despite how good um, um, Brunson looked and patient. I thought, like, towards the end, Shabazian was starting to time him I'm and piece him up a little bit. Um, but, yeah, no, I guess it doesn't matter. But Because I, I don't know, is, was it – yeah, I'm just wondering. I think I think simply I put, though, this was this was a guy who was more experienced. I mean, for God's sakes, like as much as we're we're talking about Brunson's ter- technical errors, he's fought Anderson Silva, he's fought Israel Asanya, he's fought Jacare, he's fought knocked Romero. out Uriah Hall, knocked, knocked out, Uriah out Uriah Hall, Hall. and he's, had a, took down took down Yo Romero. Yeah, right. He's been in these spots. He's ready for prime time, right? And 
you know, Edmund Shabazzian, it's not like he's got the grace of corner men in his corner, you know, hmm. guiding him along. I, Wait, you know, you I went there. I went there. Go ahead, Dave. Sorry, Jeremy, you talk. You've not said anything yet. I was just going to say that the impression I got from it, and I guess this comes with experience, is that Eric Brunson was the more <laughs> tougher fighter. Like, the entire way through, even though you could say this this route went to this guy, this route went to that guy, the entire way through, I thought that uh, Edmund Shabazzian was winning the fight. But then, um, I mean, besides from the takedowns that Brunson was able to get on him, like, I just thought that... Tactic-wise, yeah, Eric Edmund Shabazzian was the more tactically sound fighter. But uh, I guess, like you said, the, it comes with the experience. I thought that his that Brunson's toughness is what saw him to uh, to uh, finish uh, Shabazzian. Wait, yeah, Jones, no, what's, what's, wait, hold on, hold on. What's Brunson's first name? Eric Brunson, isn't it? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, I knew it. I knew Don't it. do that stuff. No, it's Derek. Yeah, come on. Derek man. Brunson. Oh, I'm sorry, Derek. Oh. <laughs> sorry, man. I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't let you get away. No, 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 no. Yeah, no, yeah. So, Other than that, though, Eric he was pretty Brunson. Stuff spot on. No, no, no. Oh, you know what? Eric Brunson. I got so many names in my head. Go ahead. Understand. Yeah, yeah, hold me accountable. Um, I definitely um, think Derek Brunson went out there and tried to out tough what's in my opinion, a supposedly more technical fighter. Um, and once again, with the experience factor as well, I, I think that played kind of, that was what determined the fight. Because on paper, Shabazian was a favorite. You know, he has like really flashy knockouts and all that kind of stuff. But what surprised me was his grappling. Um, supposedly, he'd been working with like Ronda Rousey and et cetera. And I know he's more of a, I think it was described as more of a boxer. Um, but hmm. yeah, it was he's surprising. A how he's probably boxers. I, I would I would add. I, you, you said out tough. I would also add out grind to that as well. Yeah. Because yeah, Shabazian in in the early going in the exchanges, he he was able to separate from clinches, break that back body lock, right? But like I always say, man, the 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 scramble isn't over until you say it's over. Um, I just wanted to get your guys' thoughts on this. Just a quick a quick point here. Um. Young stars out there, Shabazian, 22 years old. That's crazy. Regardless of how high you think your ceiling is, take your time, man. I know John Jones won the UFC title at 23, but, man, there's no rush to get into the UFC and fight a high level of competition because you can take one hideous loss and it just ruins your entire career because you're never the same physically afterwards. Like, you know, Max Rushkoff, I'm very interested to see how, how he responds after Austin Hubbard, right? Alex, like, Alex Hernandez. Yeah, right? Like, Hernandez. Here, here's the thing, man. Take, like, I'm not saying this will be the, the death knells of his of his career. I, you know, far far from it. But at God, the same I time, not. I hope not, too. I think Shabazian and other, other stars like him, Chase Hooper is another example. Man, what are you doing? Fight outside of the UFC, dominate the regional scene. Here's the uh, for problem. as long as it's funny you mentioned that because uh, Sean O'Malley has um, a fight coming up, and I think it's like a co main or something like that against Marlon Cheeto. Vera. Yeah, Cheeto. Yeah. Do you think he's getting the push too soon? or you know like, I think, honestly, the best thing that ever happened to Sean O'Malley is the USADA violation. Because it yeah. allowed him to just keep working, like in a weird way the best thing that ever happened to him was the USADA violation because it allowed him to just keep working on his game, keep working, keep tuning himself up, right? Keep his confidence high, rest his body, and then go in there and, and starch guys. But, you know, back on back on that point, though, like, again, you know, Derek Brunson is one of the more experienced guys in that division. He's fought everybody, everybody. And... You know, he used, he out tacked like, I guess out toughed is a word. But, and yeah, I think Edmund Shabazzian is the more technical fighter, I guess, but. More technical striker. Yeah, more technical striker. striker. But Derek Brunson just, you know, outmaneuvered and outfoxed them, um, I think, for a little while. And, you know, and, and the thing about it is Edmund probably, like, I don't know what his his cardio is like if he kind of paced himself, but he kind of got exposed as a guy who gasses out. Um, he didn't gas out. Listen, he gassed out. Here, he gassed. Here's the here, here's thing. I, it's, 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 it's hard to say because I've heard that Shabazian, his output slows in the second two rounds. 
But as a 22 year old who's young and doesn't have the wealth of experience of, of these other people, especially when you're thrown into a very grindy, you know, per, grindy fight like that, I think he can be forgiven. I, I don't <laughs> think necessarily That's someone saying, gassing out know, yeah. is always a sign of someone having bad cardio. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I didn't think. I just thought it, he just got outworked yesterday. Um, yeah. It's unfortunate, but he's going to be back. Um, and I, I just would have envisioned his grappling being better with the way they hyped him up, but I guess not. So, I mean, guys, Gary Spencer's also one of the best grapplers in the division. Like, he, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, but yeah, uh, but then he couldn't, like, take down Adesanya, who is an underrated grappler, but is. But Adesanya's takedown defense is insane. Like, okay, then yeah. why does Shabazian have the same takedown if he's supposed to be like I was? He was getting fast tracked to the okay, champion. Now, now we're now we're playing with weird weird yeah. hypotheticals, right? Like Adesanya, Shabazian is a twenty. And you have to keep in mind with Adesanya, with, he's, with, he's with been... single digit numbers to his record. Adesanya came into the UFC in his thirties with, um, you know, late twenties, but late, sorry, late twenties with an incredible wealth of experience of competition, like. These are apples and oranges. Adesanya wasn't a young up-and-comer when he made his UFC debut. I know, but I was just talking grappling-wise. In yeah, terms no, of I hear that. Yeah, Adesanya's, Adesanya's, had, uh, Adesanya's had at least eight years, seven years at least. Like no, on it's record. true. It's fair. It's fair. I think if I had to say what the thing is, is that, like, I, I hate going here, but Glendale is a sham. I'm sorry. <laughs> Lee Glendale, if you want to be on the podcast, <laughs> like anybody, the entire city of Glendale, we love you. Um, no, no, Gl- the Glendale, the Glendale Bob. Fight Club. It's not, it's not in Arizona. It's Glendale in California. But oh snap, okay. Here's, 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 here's what perplexes me about Glendale, right? Because yeah, like his training methods are bizarre. Ronda Rousey's boxing was, you know, questionable. Um, Although how does it pro- look like a superstar, which is yeah. Weird. How, how does it well? The way my boy Jack Slack put it is that it's one thing when you have a compliant mitt holder in front of you, um, you know, not playing with range and distance. It's easy for anyone to look good on the pads then, right? Yeah. But it's so strange because at the same time, at the same time, Edmund Shabazian clearly has some skills and came out of that camp. So what is it? I, it's one of the biggest is, mysteries in combat sports. You know what it is? I don't like – someone asked me this on Instagram. Right. I run the weekly like ask questions on Instagram. Sometimes you get funny ones. Sometimes you get good ones. And they asked me, should we put, pump the brakes on making fun of Glendale Fight Club and Edmund Tarvardian because of Edmund Shabazian and what he's done? And I said, no, because it's not as if they're not teaching you legit stuff. It's what they're doing is they want you to win with their stuff. It's that Edmund Tarvardian is such an egotistical guy that he wants you to win with his stuff and is willing to change you and change what you're good at to do it, right? And every once in a while, Sorry, you get a guy like Shabazian who, in, like, you know, I, is young I and work with this him. guy. What is your evidence for that? Other than Ronda Rousey, what is your evidence for that? Um, Shayna uh, the, Baszler, Jake Ellenberger, Clay Guida, Travis Brown. Yeah, there, there were a lot of fighters who went to Glendale and then said afterwards, like, you know, it's not what we thought and didn't get the same wealth of, of knowledge. And, you know, that, that man, it's, it's, it's hard to say, cause I'd like to go back and see what, if there's any evidence out there from ex Glendale fighters and what they think about the whole situation. But Dean Thomas, I, Dean Thomas went to absolute work on, on that. Like he was, I, I, I can't remember the actual article, but I'll send it to you guys. It was, yeah, Dean send it Thomas to me. Was, I'm not, was not happy, but yeah, no, I just think that, like, what it is is that, like, he wants you to win with his stuff. And, and you know, Faraz Sahabi says there's a lot of gyms out there that do this where they, you know, and, and Stefano, maybe you can attest to this. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm on an island here. They want you to win with their stuff, and they're going to yeah. change you to win with your stuff rather than maximizing your potential with what you got to mix in with what they got. And that's, I think, the central issue, right? I, I agree, I agree um, with Mike that there are a lot of gyms out there that, don't know how to make fighters of any style better. Rather, they have a mold in which they can train fighters up from um, ground zero. And any fighters that come in who have a unique style, they kind of try and fit them into that mold. And it's like a square peg. Yeah. Whereas with Shabazzian, he came in there when he was, what, 15? Like he was training he was training with Ronda at 15. So, of course, you know, 
he's going to learn and be molded into a Glendale fighter. And I think that's the, the I think that's why it it's like it works. So I I I, I, I um you know un- unless we want to spend all day talking about this, no. No. we should move on. I just wanted to ask you guys one thing before we put this fight to bed. What fight? do you think would be good for each of these two competitors uh, in their next? Uh, because Shabazian's in an interesting position where does he take a step down from competition? Would you like to see some, him with someone in the top 20 or or what? And, and you know, as far as Brunson, who would you like to see him in against next? I think I think Shabazian versus Heinich or... yeah, I think, yeah Don't yeah. do that to the poor dude, man. Come on. Ian Heinich is a mean guy. Like, yeah, but it's also no, it's no, 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 no. But Ian Heinrich, I think, is a good tough test for him. You know, outside the top ten, but inside the top top fifteen. You know, good striker, tough guy. Like you have to, you look. You know, what I'm saying he's in the fire now. Give him one more fight in the fire. Like let's let's see it. Are you good enough to be a top fifteen fighter? Let's see it. Right? We can't keep we can't like keep playing this protect game with the young prospects all the time. Right? He. Let's give him one more. Which is exactly, passed, yeah. Yeah, no, if go he passed on. the test, then fine. I think it's a perfect fight. Like, I think that's that's the one I'd give. Okay, I've seen well, how, which is just, why I think these prospects should have time to develop. Those that's what, that, I'm actually that's with Stefano on this one. I'm actually with Stefano on this one. I think he should take, like, a, a fight a little bit lower down because Heinish just seems like a, like, too, like, he hits too hard. He should take, like, a grappler or something. Jump like, somebody, somebody, Shabazzian was number seven ranked. Like, what were you talking about? Guys, so how – well, number seven ranked, Sorry, I, again, not necessarily in the competition, but how would you guys like the to see – The point is that he was, he was there. How would you like to see – I'm thinking Derek Brunson versus Kelvin Gastelum would be an interesting yes, matchup. that's what oh, I was thinking. And I think maybe Edmund Shabazian, let's get him in with – who? Maybe like an Eric Anders? What do you think about that? Your boy Eric Anders. Ooh, I don't know about that. I mean, another because hard hitter. A, a hard hitter. Um, less technical. more of a less technical, but somebody again who can mix it together in the same way that um, you know gave yeah. him problems, but not necessarily on the level that Derek Brunson is able to do it. And I think not necessarily with the physical consequences of how hard Brunson can hit. So it might be a good shot at redemption for him. Who knows? Why not Heinich? Like, why are you guys so adverse to Heinich? I'm not, but... Stefano's not uh, adverse. Um, I just think Heinich is too... If we're looking for a favorable matchup for Shabazz, yeah, I don't think I don't that's, that's a favorable one. one. Yeah. But I'm not... Heinich is an, up, an, an upward trajectory, and he's, like, had, what, like, three or four fights in the UFC. Um, he's, like, what, 30, 30-something? 30 like, I don't know. He just seems... I'd like Brunson versus Heinich or something like that, but I don't think... Heinich already lost. Heinish. Oh, oh yeah, that's true. That is true. <laughs> let's, true. You guys wanna you guys wanna move along now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I kind of I kind of want to cover the other uh, fights on this the the main yes, card because they were all fairly interesting. I thought Jennifer Maya versus uh, JoJo. No, on the main card I said. Oh, okay. There's just three more. Yeah, JoJo versus Jennifer Maya. Man, um, I feel so bad for JoJo. Risky fight. Why would she take I, that fight? And this is you know I respect her for taking the fight as well, but man, this is the problem with. Wanting to stay active in order because, to because she was pressured to she was yeah. pressured let's let's call it what it is like yeah. the UFC brass brass no, <laughs> the UFC brass pressured her to date to this fight and that's not on them like I'm not saying I didn't say JoJo can say yes or no but I think what happened here is they were like hey you know be in our good graces they do this all the time right be in our good graces take a risky fight and if you say no then they drag your your name under the mud right um. Not just that, but apparently, if the UFC, let's say you have three, fight, you're, you're, uh, they offer you three fights per year on your contract, right? If you turn down fights, then you're not eligible to be to be paid for those three fights. If they can't find you three fights over that time, then they have to pay you those three fights that you were promised. So maybe it was at risk of not not being paid, but. In, in all fairness, I agree that maybe not the strategically smartest decision in the long run because she was next in line for, um, you know, Valentina. I think this has always kind of been a hole in Joanne Calderwood's game, right, as far as the ground goes. And I think in all likelihood, it's something that Valentina probably would have exploited anyways. 
Yeah, fair. So. I, I gotta go and, back and see this up because yeah, my memory's failing me right now. With that I, being I, said, I, I, I can walk you through it because I love I love you. Know, she 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 went underneath to threaten, grabbed underneath the leg to threaten that uh, drawbridge oh, sweep. No, no drawbridge sweep. It's, oh, okay. um, you know which one I'm talking about, right? Where you grab grab the leg and then you swing your legs through like you're a yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, threaten the drawbridge sweep, and it's good because people are worried about getting their balance offset. That they don't address the armbar, and uh, yeah, I Jennifer Maya just pursuing that yeah, armbar until that was really the nice. Yeah. That was really nice. I just watched it. Um, yeah, also interesting is how she kind of moved her face as uh, Joanna put her knee across her face as well. So that was pretty cool. Um, when I was watching it back then. Uh, that's where that's what separates like your blue belts from your brown belts is the transitioning into stuff, right? Mm-hmm. It's not just doing the initial the initial. It's the second effort, the third effort, the fourth effort in the jujitsu. And, and to be fair, sorry, go on. I'm no, just, go, no, no, wrestling no. scrambles. I, I was also going to say to be fair, Jennifer Maya had her way striking too. Um, I hate 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 her style. Hate it. I wouldn't say had her way. Sorry? I wouldn't say had her way. I would say that she was landing, and I would say that she was effective. Yeah, she She was was effective. effective. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't say, like, she was dominating necessarily, but I I would definitely say she, you know, had the advantage, weirdly enough, which you would assume Mm -hmm. Joanna Calder would have. uh, JoJo's more of like a... JoJo, though, is more of like an avalanche in her style more so than, like, a wall. Like, in the sense that JoJo likes to build it, and then as soon as your second round comes and all of a sudden you're in deep water, right? It's like, that's kind of the way Jojo works. Um, yeah. But- lo- lo- loves those, those classic Muay Thai weapons of attrition. And honestly, um, I heard that previously to getting into MMA, she was billed as like the queen of knees. Like she had excellent knees and teeps up the center, but hasn't been able to employ them as much because of the threat of the takedown. Which is weird because it's like, if she can just get that double plum, I as a tall woman, I think she she really have a lot of success with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was this like uh, yeah, you know what? I'm not even gonna go too much into it. I feel like you know she was getting tuned up uh, for the most part. I know she comes from that Mai Tai background, but from what I know, she's been doing MMA for a real long time, and I don't want to be too critical. But they kept making a point in the commentary about Mai Tai people will never move their heads um, as an in opposition, you had Jennifer Jennifer Maya, who was pretty much. I hate that style. I can't I've been it. leaving. It was disgusting. Why don't you looked, like it? I just didn't like it. It doesn't look aesthetically pleasing. Like, no, no, it no. Looks you don't like, like it when Jennifer Maya does it. You don't like it when Jennifer Maya does it. Maybe not when. You Jennifer, like it when Mike Tyson does it, I bet. Yeah, but it's like I don't know. Just the way she did it was really awkward. It looks awkward. awkward. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I understand but, sometimes there's a fighter where you just personally have a distaste for yeah. their art. You know? It was I get that. for sure. It was effective for sure. And I get why she especially exaggerated it because she wanted to stay on the light on her, tea, on her toes, wanted to turn it into more of a boxing match, um, right. movement, all of that uh, against a more so, uh, yeah. solitary um Fine. And the so, one thing about stationary. Jojo, too. Is solitary. <laughs> I want to be by myself. <laughs> oh, wait. Leave me alone. Oh, wait. <laughs> right, but the one thing about JoJo that I will say, though, in her striking is if you want to exploit something, if you're going to stand up with her, is she's not very good going backwards and going left and right. Like, now, that is a she's good time at, she, Yeah, she's not very good going back and left and right. She's she's good at staying in center and going one for one with you and having these wars of attrition. And so, you know, one of the things that Valentina, yeah, but one of the things Valentina is good at, even though she is comes from a Muay Thai background, is Valentina is really good at going left or right on you for Mm -hmm. for whatever reason. Valentina, are you watching? Valentina, Ah. the queen, the queen. Valentina's my dude, the artist. Va- Valentina's yeah, but that's not Val. Oh my God, there's so many myths there about uh, out about this woman. She's much more of a stationary target. Not no, saying that as a negative she's thing. She's a stationary target. She's but, like, much I'm more saying stationary you... and like uh, Muay Thai style of like uh, not eat the counter, but like deflect the counter and return. Right? No, I know she returns, but the thing is, like, you're talking about her like she's Holly Holm. No, I know. I get where I get where like the concern. I'm not saying, oh yeah, she's gonna like you know take three steps to the side and and you know no. What I'm saying though is, 
she can she's very quick in the sense that she can kind of for whatever reason go side to side really quick to then come back on you for some for whatever reason she does it with her kicks she does it with her punches but anyway the point i'm trying to make is the though that if you are jennifer maya you do want to bob and weave to jojo's sides right you want to get there that's kind of what you do want to do right um yeah no, um, right. I just it wasn't aesthetically pleasing for me personally, but yeah. who cares? You won. Well, so. David, I, I I hope that Jennifer Maya can one day live up to your aesthetic expectations. <laughs> um, that being said, that's that came off so wrong. I know. I know. Uh, Victoria, if you're in there, that's not how it sounds. Hilarious. Um, no, man. But I loved her celebration, though. That was cute. Sorry, go on. <laughs> Wow, very sexist, David. Very sexist. Okay. Um, so, Vincente Luque versus Randy Brown. Oh, this man. was an enjoyable fight, and I think it was a real... Oh, my God. <laughs> These guys both burying their head in their hands. Look, I oh. think Randy Brown gave a very good account of himself. I thought his jab looked phenomenal. Um, I he's like always, Randy Brown. Yeah, he's always funky. Yeah. He's always entertaining. I, it's just Vincente Luque is a goddamn tank. Um <laughs> And he got to those weapons of attrition early, like that uh, low, low kick that over the distance are going to pay dividends and force Randy Brown to not be able to circle the cage and have to stay in place and, uh, you know, not get out of exchanges when he should. I thought he was doing a good job in the early going, but man, those weapons of attrition ate away at him until he's there vulnerable for the counter. Yeah, I was a big. I, I became a big fan of Randy Brown. I'm not that familiar with his work, honestly. Um <laughs> but after this fight, I'm definitely a big fan. Big fan, not necessarily because of anything. To you know, I always shout out. You know, I think he's from like New York um, and Jamaica and whatever. But his style is just so interesting. It's one of those styles you see and you're like, okay, this dude looks different from everyone else. Just the way he throws that jab out, it was like, I don't know. It was like, it was a thing of beauty almost. Like it was so quick, so long. Um, He's got so, so many athletic. Events. Yeah, man. He and he had, he was really flashy when he first came out, but you know, once Luke started putting it on him, then he started being a little bit more um, conventional in terms of keeping his hand. Well, I don't even say he kept his hands up because his hands were down for the most time. For the most part, he kept his hands so low on that jab, it's almost like offensive. But I get it because he's long and he's like light on his feet. Um, there's a, so I would say there's the advantages, though. There's advantages to keeping your jab that low. One of them being is it comes from an awkward angle uh, so that it's difficult to see coming, right? Sure. Uh, it's difficult to parry because how the hell are you going to parry something coming in from that low? And for someone with a hands-up kind of, you know, very uh, high guard, high guard roll, uh, roll off the shots and return kind of style, it splits right through that guard. Right. So, mm -hmm. no, there was definitely advantages. And I don't think there's an inherently right way to hold your hand, especially in MMA, where you have the threat of the takedown. Um, exactly. Because exactly. like that just makes things more complex. But I feel like, you know, his ha I don't have a problem with where his hands were. Um, I just feel for me, what really stood out was the leg kicks from Luke, because as soon as he started landing those leg kicks um, on that lead leg and literally turning Randy's body with the leg kicks to sitting him down at one point. See, this is the problem with going sideways style in MMA is that you can't check a leg kick. That's exactly. And that's, but, to but you don't have to be able to, you can, there's other, you know, there's other answers uh, to checking. You can retract, the, you can retract the leg, right? I think retracting the leg is a, perfectly acceptable option yeah you can and you can jam the kick too like not a lot of guys even in muay thai not a lot of guys jam anymore remember back in the 80s when that was all people did and now i mean know? i don't personally remember but i no, I yeah, there, man, but, I uh, but i've seen uh, tape so i know what you're talking about yeah like you know they would jam the leg and guys aren't jamming anymore guys yeah. aren't teaching jamming anymore it's you know but the point the is, is that, like i well i hear your point but to me to be fair you know, um, these are kind of eight, issues with it yeah, to be fair, Luque was throwing, not necessarily like old school, and they said this during the broadcast, so I'm not saying anything new. He wasn't throwing like old school, like mid or high or upper thigh kicks. He was throwing calf kicks, um, which are, from what I understand, a little bit harder to check because if you lift your leg, like you're done. Um, but I, I still think, yeah, with the movement that Brown had, with the length that he had, like it was surprising he couldn't, and I assume he's a good kicker, but it was surprising. 
he couldn't like time that a little bit better or get out the way of some of those kicks. And I feel like eventually he couldn't stand. Like he literally hurt himself to the point where he had to switch to like you know orth or I think it was like southpaw for a bit. Yes. And then yeah. Yeah. that's when Luke was just like tuning him up, and after that it was a wrap. And that's that's the problem with uh you know going fighting a fighter against uh, like Vincente Luque. If you look at Stephen Wonderboy Thompson's approach to him, which is, you know, his only defeat in recent memory for me, mm -hmm. uh, he stayed super, you have to stay super disciplined. You have to stay on your bicycle, right? And you have to keep him guessing as yeah. to when your leg is going to be available to kick or not. Stay out of range, mm -hmm. keep faking, fainting, pretending like you're going to enter in range and not. And then uh, when you do enter into range, you, you're in it out. No. You're in and out, right? And, and, and you if you're going to fight I, side on, if you're going to fight side on uh, against an opponent like Luke, that's how you have to do it. Yeah, thank you for saying that, actually, because another thing that surprised me was not necessarily, I don't want to say how easy he was landing the leg kicks, but he was doing barely any setup. It wasn't like the leg kicks were like after like a, a flurry or like some movement or anything. He was just like standing and then just would like pr basically run up and smash his legs and like, you know what? You know what? Though every once in a while, you st you tend to see um, guys get gassed up because they have early success, and then if they put themselves in trouble. I think a lot of it was Randy Brown stayed in the pocket a yeah. little too long because the jab was landing early. And yeah. I mean, look, you know what? Randy Brown is a better fighter than three of me combined. <laughs> but you know, yeah, hey, who, who he can blame him? Yeah. Who, who can who can blame him? Even Stephen Wonderboy Thompson in their matchup got caught hanging around in the pocket a little bit too long, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Luke Luke makes his living off of being able to force you to stay in the pocket a little too long, and then that cross counter over the top or that left hook are coming for you, and it's lights out. Yeah, man. And what a guy, man. Luke is only 28 years old, which is just ridiculous. Take um, a lot of damage, though. Yeah, yeah, I hear you, but like he still has a future, in my opinion. Like, oh, you know, absolutely, quite mm -hmm. well into his deep thirties. Um, and the knockout particularly was super duper nice. I don't think it, it was weird because I felt like not even weird. It just I I'm not sure I've seen too many of those where someone's intentionally holding someone up so they can land the knee. Um, and on a non grounded opponent, like I thought that was pretty clever and pr really savvy for somebody. It, only just, it made me sad because I was like, stop, he's already dead. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm going to say it. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes, right? Don't wow. don't try and game the system in a sport as dangerous as MMA. And that's not a get knock against Randy Brown. I'm just saying, like, if you try and game the system in MMA, it's dangerous, right? Yeah. This, right. Isn't, I, this I isn't always, basketball. This isn't yeah, basketball. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You can't DeMar DeRozan pump fake your way to, a free, to the free throw line in MMA. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is different. So when you do play that game... You know, fair enough, fair enough. I mean, I don't know if it was trying. Uh, well, I guess you guys would know better than me. I thought it was almost like a let me put my hands down so I can get my base kind of thing, as opposed to um, I'm trying to game the system kind of thing. And I think I think it was Dominic Cruz made a good point about how if you want to get to your base, you should just go on your knees as opposed to try and reach down. Um, the bomb is now all of a sudden. Well, against Luke, you could probably get away with it because I haven't really seen Luke's ground game. You know, Apparently his game, ground game is really good. Luke Luke is um, a aficionado with the Darce choke. He's got a he's got a very underrated ground game. Yeah, yeah. I, I just thought it was weird. Yeah, um, and shouts out that dude because that was a great knock knockout. Yeah. I uh, so any, any more you guys wanted to say about this because I'm I'm we got one more matchup on this yeah, one card me too. and it was a fun. Yeah. It was fun. What a hey, fight, I, man! This this, this fight. was this was a rematch from their initial. Yeah. Um, fight back three years ago which was a draw which i loved i mean if you if if lando Venata or bobby green are in a boring fight like let me know because these, these men every time they're in the octagon deliver a master class yeah, what is that in the background what is going on Okay, okay, yeah, no, Lando Venata, man, that was a really special fight. Aliens have taken because... over the podcast. Sorry. <laughs> it's interference. Um, yeah, that was really special because, yeah, man, once again, that jab of Bobby Green, my goodness, I don't know what it is. 
with I just love a really good jab. Like it's almost like a like a thing of beauty, like a piece a of man art. after my heart. It, man, no, <laughs> it's so beautiful. His striking, yeah. his boxing was clean. Like I don't know, it was what I would envision MMA boxing should look like, in my opinion. But Lando Venado was also really creative with the striking, which yeah. I loved as well. It made for a really open I, fight. It's and sad with, that this fight, though, like when you look at the judges' scorecards, was so lobsided. Crazy. Was, I don't see how. Well, the, the, knock, the, knock, the knockdowns in the later round, in the third round, I think. Contributed yeah, to like that. 30 to 27 and 130 to 26. Come on. Like. Come on. Look, if you give a 10-8 in that last round, I can see the 30-27. But I, I just want to say to David's David's earlier point about Bonato's, about uh, Bobby Green's boxing. Man, a lot of fighters have a good jab, but they don't have an educated jab. And Bob, Bobby Green has an educated jab. The the way he was mixing up timing with it, the way he'd flick the jab out just to get Lando Venata to pull his head back because he knew that was a, it, what his reaction would be, just to flick it out again while he's uh, fully extended back in that. That's, that. That is an educated jab. Bobby Green, one of the pioneers of the um, the shoulder roll defense in MMA. Man, I love it. And uh, Venata uses his front kick similar to how Bobby Green uses his jab. So I could I could I could see the, them run this back a hundred times and I'd be this satisfied. Was, this was a really pretty fight. Um, and I also wanted to say Bobby Green's um, was it Bobby Green? I think this was the right fight where he would get caught up like let's say on like one of the corners on the cage and then each time he would like spin and try an elbow like a spinning elbow out or I think of a different. That's fight. John Jones you're thinking of, David. No, 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 no. <laughs> David, I think that was this on. fight Not as well. All black people look alike. Okay. <laughs> I think that was this fight as well. And yeah, it looks really good, man. What a fight. What a great fight. Sorry, Michael. No, I'm I hey man, I agree. I will ask though, like at what point is Lando Vernada just a fun fight and not a you know winner? Lando uh, Ver- Vernada? Vernada, whatever. Okay, but, so I'm not a hater, man. He's I don't Italian, just, so it's Italian, pronounce it correct. No. Uh, uh, Lando Lando Bob. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, man, he looked great. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a question for you. Do you think that you have to always be striving for the championship as a career fighter? Or can you just say, like, I'm good at this skill and I just want to do fun fights? I think that's the problem I run into is... Sorry, go ahead. I think you should strive for a championship. You don't become a pro football player, pro basketball player, just to be a pro. I mean, most guys do. Most guys do, but, like... I'm not going to name any names, but the point of you being on that team is to win a Super Bowl or win an NBA championship or win a Stanley Cup. Like, so I think like you should try and win a championship if you're going to be a pro fighter. I, 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 know, I know it's different. I know that I know it's different. Like the circumstances are different. There's a lot of different variables, variables. But I mean, what are you in the sport to do? You win. I, I, I largely agree with you, Jeremy. But like, let's say let's take. Donald Cerrone is a case as a case example. He's somebody who's at an advanced enough age where he's probably not going to develop too much in his skill set as far as he's not going to have a 180 metamorphosis. His weaknesses, right, while he's an elite fighter, his weaknesses are pretty pronounced. They're out there. Everyone knows them. Uh, and he's in a spot where he's not going to be winning titles anytime soon as a result because the book's kind of out there on him. But he still can put on a very entertaining performance. He can still headline a card. He still loves to fight, and he can still win at a high level. So as a guy for him, like him, it's kind of realistic that, you know, he's not going to win a title. But who's to say that we shouldn't put on a Donald Cerrone-Anthony Pettis fight, and that could be the co-main event on a pay-per-view? Why not? The problem I, I run into – sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to respond that although it's the reality, I don't ever think you should voice that as your reality. Like, you should always say – um, I'm trying to get a championship. And even still, it should be your mentality. And then maybe when you look back on your career, you can say, okay, I was a good fighter and I made some of my career. But it should always be your mentality to, uh, you know, put a belt on. Like, I guess that'll, that mentality will carry you further. Right. Look, yeah. I, I, I'm not trying to disrespect Venata when I say that. Like, what I'm trying to explain is that the problem I run into is that we talk about a striker bias in the UFC a lot, right? And we talk and we and we say that the UFC is not a major meritocracy. And the problem I run into, and I say this as a guy who like is a striker primarily in his fights. Like I'm not 
you know, um, but if we are a meritocracy and guys can get cut after losing two straight, Bernada is like literally knocking on, hold on, hold on. He's, he's, what is he, lost four straight at this point? Right? I don't know. It's just, it's a, it doesn't seem fair in my mind, right? Like if I can realistically say if, if the UFC is a meritocracy, why are you saying that, Michael? To I'm lose four straight and like this, it just—I don't understand. I str- I'm struggling because I don't understand why that's I fair. Lando like, Veneta is not on a four-fight win streak. He was actually on a two-fight win streak before this fight. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And fine. to your point, even if he wasn't a four-fight losing streak, I generally believe this is the entertainment game and not a sport and not the sport game. Unfortunately. Okay, and then, and then, uh, and that's what I'd say that's somewhere in between. CM Punk in the UFC. And that's why you get CM Punk in the UFC because now all of a sudden it turns into an entertainment game. It's yeah, not it's, a meritocracy. I'd say it's somewhere, I'd say it's somewhere in between. But it's yeah. not a meritocracy. <laughs> that's my point. I'm agreeing with you. It's not a meritocracy. Yeah, anymore. combat sports isn't necessarily. Look, it's it's Maybe weird it's because we're we're in a gray area. Combat sports is really in a gray area where I, I I forget who said it, but they put it very well when they said we're kind of the the red light district of sports, combat sports, right? We're kind of the the seedy, you know, other sports don't necessarily like to associate with us. And we are a sport, but we're also not a sport. Like we, yeah. we, we're somewhere in this gray area where we're definitely entertainment. But at the same time, like it's, it's really hard to, um, you know, if you were looking at like what percentage is mixed martial arts a sport and entertainment? Like it's both. I, I, I don't know. It's, it's really, it's something it's, it's uncomfortable and definitely some, at some points in history and some MMA promotions, it's more spectacle than sport. And in others, it's more sport than spectacle. And also, well, look, maybe it can be competitive, like, but the ultimate goal maybe isn't always to win every, like win everything. Like in other sports, like some of the most competitive athletic endeavors, like ballet, and cheerleading and all those stuff they're not necessarily like golf they're not go- well golf yeah <laughs> golf is not a sport like, like they're not necessarily all about winning but they have but they fuel so much competition they like they they bring out the best out of people like maybe yeah. it maybe it's i maybe i have to agree maybe it's in that gray area where it's like you're there to re- to compete against yourself you're there to be the best fighter you can be. Like the way I'm that saying, I see it is that. All I'm saying is, Lando, okay, so Lando Granada's record in the UFC: three, five, and two. If you okay. get a grappler with that record, he's gone. That's but why if I'm he's an, if he's if he's, he's a Khabib style grappler who's entertaining to, or a Hamzat Khimaev, my goodness, I think I just spat something. A Hamzat Khimaev, um, Chimaev, um then people are entertained. Like, there's no way you can watch those two fighters and say those are boring fighters. What? Okay, Khabib, I, here's where I disagree. I hear, because, here's where I disagree. I've, heard, I've got friend after friend after friend I've got to explain to as to, like, I, I, I literally go to the gym and you hear this, bro signs, oh, Khabib, all he does is leg hump you. Yeah, right? listen, listen, so, I, I, I agree. I, I agree thoroughly with Mike, and I think that, Khabib ha- was able – Hamza Chamay is, is interesting because he bears a resemblance to Khabib and he has two quick finishes, right? That's why people are interested, not because they appreciate uh, sophisticated grappling. And you can argue that people don't appreciate sophisticated striking either. They just appreciate two people getting hit. But I would say that they appreciate it far more than they do grappling. And I think if anybody had a win streak like Khabib's and was as dominant as he was and was a striker, they would have gotten the title shots a long time ago. Khabib succeeded in spite of the fact that he's a grappler, not but, because of it. And by the way, Mike, you, I mean, uh, David, you like, you know, you like your, your PC terminology and, you know, I like some as well. So I came up with a new term for MMA. It's grappler shaming. Dana White <laughs> grapple shames us grapplers. You know what? You know what? You're right. I, I do think that there's definitely a bias against grappling, mostly because I think with striking and not the you sorry with striking you have knockouts which is way more finite which is way more um, in the public conscious uh, in terms of how I don't know what's gonna I don't want to get too meta here but 
everyone understands what a knockout is in terms of a fist fight, but not everybody understands what uh, uh, a grappling match is, um, at least on some fundamental level. Um, I just want to go back to the whole entertainment sport. I actually completely disagree with everybody. I think entertainment and sport are intertwined, at least in the modern day. If we're talking about something like the Olympics, which even then I think entertainment is a big fa- big factor there. I think that in numerous oh, also corruption. Sports, yeah, and corruption and corruption. And but I think doping. Yep, yeah, and doping. But th- once again, even the doping is for competition, but it's also for like entertainment. Like how why do people um uh, use steroids in the UFC to get bigger, faster, stronger, but also so that they can do all that stuff without getting tired and they can and do the most flashy money. stuff. Yeah, and make more money That's because true. now That's they're true. an exciting fighter. So I agree with you in terms of, you know, th- that competition always needs I'm to just, be in you. All I'm trying to say is is that we, we have to stop playing this game of the UFC's a meritocracy until you're a grappler well, and you lose two straight. Not I agree. I agree. Hold on. I actually no, but like this, we pretend as if it is. We pretend. Everyone pretends. Oh, yeah. Dana White pretends. Right. You yeah, know? It, that's, it that's true. I, I thoroughly agree with David, though, in that, yeah, there is that big entertainment aspect to other sports as well that we were kind of ignoring. Where I would disagree, though, is you wouldn't have, after a very cerebral, unentertaining performance, like let's say by, I know I keep bringing this example up, by the New Jersey Devils of the early 2000s, who were a dominant team, boring as hell though, right? But they were able to keep on doing their thing and people would still come out and watch. If you have and a Scott boring- Scott Stevens would, would murder people in center ice, but whatever. Yeah. If, you have, if you have a boring cerebral performance as a fighter, people are going to say, hey, no organization's going to sign you. You have to think about the entertainment of it as well. Wrong and I've had people have- Disagree, man. You can't disagree. disagree. You can't, you can't disagree necessarily... with that. You can't disagree with that. And I'll tell you why, because I've had that conversation with people at a high level no, who have been passed that, over. That doesn't exist. It's not that what you're saying doesn't exist. It's that it also exists in other sports. Guys, basketball, Detroit, um, the Detroit Pistons of the 08. Does anybody consider them or herald them as a great team? It because was first off, it's 04, but yeah. 04, my bad. Whatever. I know what you're saying. I do understand what you're my saying. That's fair. That's Even fair. in soccer, we have defensive teams all the time, and they get blamed yeah. regardless of how successful they are. No, so fair, fair, fair. I think, like, entertainment, especially once there's money involved, entertainment is always going to be in the sport, in my opinion, but... I, I, I just want I want to I want to bring up something about what you said earlier where where I think uh, just a funny little story about how you said that uh, a knockout and striking is a lot more intuitive than grappling. Do you guys remember when uh, Ken Shamrock fought Pat Smith at UFC one? Yes. Uh, no. <laughs> nope? Okay. So Pat Smith was a, a Muay Thai fighter. Ken Shamrock mm-hmm. had been fighting in Pancrase. So Pancrase, it was one of the first organizations to mix the martial arts together. And he was more of a, a shoot fighter, a grappler than anything else with striking. Took Pat Smith down and heel hooked him, right? First leg lock in the UFC. Uh, Pat Smith taps out because he's about to have his knee destroyed. They stand up and the crowd starts booing. The crowd starts booing because they're like, what is this? Like, keep on, they wanted them to keep on fighting. They didn't know what happened. They didn't know what happened. They're like, this isn't this tap up. This wasn't a definitive end to the fight. Keep going, like let them keep fighting. So, yeah. Oh yeah, you weren't here when I said it last week. I've been trying to get a little bit into grappling, and man, it's it's super fascinating. And I get why grapplers prefer grappling to striking because it's so. I don't want to say more technical, but it's it's so intricate. And yeah, no, I, I get it. I, and I definitely think there's an agenda against grapplers in general, but. And I'm, I'm saying this as a striker, like most of my fights, I, I stand and, and I, I use grappling as a defense or like a transitioning tool. I don't use it like, um, you know, as an offensive thing. Yeah, stop the fight. Yeah. Right. So it's fun though. It's great. It's interesting when you yeah. understand it and you're like, Oh no, now I see what they're trying to do. It's almost like a, it's, Literally, I know last episode uh, was called 4D Chess. It's literally chess, but just in a different format. More, more advanced than chess, I'd say, as someone who used to play chess a lot. Um, because chess, there's a finite amount of moves. But with the human body, there's like... Anything could go. Again, infinite anything. amount of combinations. Yeah. Um, guys, you want to... Let's let's move along because yeah, we have please. story yeah. time and we have some... You want me to you want me to read can, out these questions that we have? Can we please can we please talk the NBA because the Raptors Let's have Raptors. the Let's go of their Raptors. lives. You can take a coffee break, Steph. No, don't worry. Yeah. Um, That's I'll, prepare, I'll prepare the questions. <laughs> <Yeah>. But <laughs> I'll be back. 
you know, the Raptors, um, go, look, I compare, if, 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 if there's any MMA fans, I'll say this. The Raptors are the Tony Ferguson of the NBA. You know? Not That's very... Comparison. You know what I'm saying? They, they aren't very... Because the Raptors... I said the same thing, David. Or like, I don't I'll, I'll put it to you like this. I'll put it to you like this. The Raptors put a pace on you defensively that's mentally exhausting. And in the first quarter, it's like being in the shallow water. You're like, okay, this isn't so bad. He's not as good as I thought. Like, you know what I'm saying? He's got some stuff, but not not the greatest technical guy. You know, he's got some some interesting things about him. He grabby rolls every once in a while. But okay, you know, like with the Raptors, like they'll, they'll go after it. But it's not so bad. We're only down by four. And you're at halftime and you're in the deeper water. And you're like, okay, it's a little harder, but but you know what? We're still okay. But then by the third and fourth quarter, these guys keep this defensive pace on you. And you saw in that fourth quarter, LeBron James was done. He was like, this is insane, right? <laughs> the Lakers were held to what? Some insane number, like 36% from the field. Yeah. Ridiculous. I don't know about the co- the comparison. I like the metaphor. I see where you're going with it. Um, I just think... Ferguson strikes me as more of an offensive fighter than uh, a defensive fighter. So okay. I would love a de- defensive um, comparison, but I like where you're going with that. Uh, just shouts out the Raptors, man. Shouts out Nick Nurse. My goodness. And, 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 you, and you better watch your most about Kyle Lowry, by the way. Yo, you, man, you, I take it back, Kyle. I take it 14 no. boards. <laughs> yo, are you kidding me? Like, are you kidding me? My goodness. This, oh, yo, I almost, yo, I almost swore. But, yeah, this dude is ready to ball. I'm ready. Let's go, Raptors. This is a great return. Yeah, this is a great return for the Raptors. Honestly, like, OG stepped up. Kyle Lowry played. I'm Nigerian. Yeah, man. Honestly, like, on days when Siakam uh, is struggling to find his rhythm, this is what's going to get him through the playoffs. Like, uh, you have seven guys averaging more than like more, averaging double digits all season. Like this was a great showing for the Raptors. My question to you guys is, and then we can get into the playoff a little bit. Like we can get into a little bit of the playoffs later. But do you think the Raptors can hang on to that second seed? No. Like, and, and I'm, not- I'm gonna expose Michael really quick. I'm gonna expose Michael really quick. Michael was really doubting that the Raptors can hang on to the second seed. And honestly, now that I realize the house... It wasn't because they suck. It wasn't because they suck. Are, I'm kind of having my uh, second thoughts too. But I always said from the beginning that the Raptors can hang on to the second seed. All they need to do is win the games that they're supposed to win against Memphis. And I think it's... Uh, Orlando. Memphis or Orlando. And then they can steal a game here and there, which they did. <laughs> they stole a game against the Lakers. So they just need to steal they another steal. game. Hold on, hold on. And they they're, and they're steal. Stealing pretty is disrespectful. Play. All right, stealing go ahead. It's disrespectful. What they did is kick down the front door, took some food, held them at gunpoint, left with their girlfriend. That's true. That's what they That's did. Yeah, yeah, no, they dominated that. They dominated that match. Okay. Um, um, I don't know. I I'm looking at they can hang on to it. Look, I just think that the Raptors are in murderer's row. Like, do you see yeah. their schedule? This is a travesty. It's ridiculous. If Miami. Orlando, Boston, Memphis, uh, Milwaukee. They have the hardest schedule in the league. Yeah, they have the hardest schedule. Denver. I think maybe the Orlando fight, the Orlando fight, (laughs) the Orlando match, Memphis, the 76ers were not great yesterday. Um, Or is it two days? No, yesterday. Um, And honestly, I don't know about Boston because I know they only lost to Milwaukee, but I don't know, man. I feel like every year they're always overhyped. In my opinion, I don't know whether it's the Bill Simmons thing, but they're always, always overhyped in terms of how entertaining they are to watch and how good they actually are. Um, I, I failed. I, I'm to a see. Brad Stevens guy, though. I'm a Brad. Sure, Stevens. whatever. I'm a Nick Nurse guy. I'm a Nick Nurse guy. Whatever. Um, I like Nick Nurse. I think he's a better coach. I, I, yeah, wow. Well, how I, about Lamar Odom and the Raptors? Right? No, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Hilarious. But they're four games back. That's four games. Come on. Look, I just. It's I think murderers. To hashtag respect the Raptors. They're the defending champs, okay? They're supported by Drake. What more can you want? Exactly. Let's go, people. No, definitely. I think after yesterday, I think you're going to see a lot more people putting respect on the Raptors' name. Like, and if they don't, surprise, surprise. But, like, the Raptors need are. LeBron said it. They're title contenders. Like, 
I'm going to have to see how they play these eight games, but I think after this eight games, I'll be able to make my decision and say whether they're title contenders or not. But as if, if based on yesterday's showing, I don't know. They look like they look like a title contending team. Man, I also want to say just, just the mental before, exhaustion they put on guys, man. Just like, before yeah. we switch topics, man, shout out Joel Embiid, like forty-one and or forty-two twenty-one. Are you kidding me? Like this <laughs> dude is balling. Are you kidding me? Twenty-one rebounds? Get out of here, man. man. And your team and, lost. Come on. Yeah, I was about to say, and the Sixers lost <laughs> to Orlando. Orlando. Oh my God. Man, I'd be beefing <laughs> my team. Oh. Man. Yeah. But, anyway. All right, all right, all right. Steph, no, Question time, question time. Okay, yeah. Now back to real sports. I can't wait. Oh, okay. man. Who, who, which basketball player pissed in your cereal? Come on, man. Who is? Uh, Steph knows a basketball know who player. Pissed in my cereal? Who be? If I was a basketball player, I'd be either Meta World Peace or, um, you know Meta World Peace, right? Yeah, uh, of we're course. familiar with him. Yeah, and, or uh, who's the crazy guy with the dyed hair, you know? Dennis Rodman? Dennis Rodman. Hilarious. So you're more of a defensive a guy. Um, no, I just meant because they're crazy. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, we actually have about five five questions today. Oh my okay. goodness! Why is our po- our podcast getting way more popular? One one question. No, I'm kidding. Go ahead. Let's let's, <laughs> let's rattle them off. Okay, so this one comes from Rob Protomani, BGR. Oh, I love Rob. I'm sure you do. Um, Rob asks. Who's next for Tony Ferguson? That's a good Dustin question. Poirier. Poirier would be an interesting matchup. I'd like to see that. Um, hmm. Yeah, because let me pull up the lightweight top ten right Yeah, now. I'm going to pull up the rankings. That's what I'm doing right now. Because Poirier's an interesting, interesting matchup. Uh, topology. All right. Yeah. But... I just think that, like, if it's either Connor or Dustin, and since Connor definitely isn't fighting, then why not? Why not, right? Winner gets Habib next. Yeah, who the hell knows what Connor is doing? And I, I feel like Connor won't step in for either a ridiculously uh, easy matchup or as much as I'd like to see Tony versus um, versus Connor, he's not stepping in for a money fight or a give me fight, uh, as it would seem. So we have Tony versus. Ooh, how about Tony versus Dan Hooker? That's an interesting one, too. I thought that was an interesting fight, but he's coming off a loss to Dustin Poirier. Um, and They're both also, coming off losses. Yeah, yeah, but, well, that's a good point. But I think, I don't know, I don't know. Oh, my God. Okay, how do you not make an interesting fight with Tony in this division? I'm just, I know, I, that, I was going to say Paul Felder as well, um, because... Did I think he retire? That, he says he wants to come back. Okay. Did he Felder retire? Versus, Felder versus yeah, Tony? Okay, here's the thing. If we're looking at what would be an interesting matchup or what would be a favorable matchup for Tony to get back into it, I think Felder would be a fun fight that would leave us, you know, it would be like a fight of the the millennium candidate. Um, let's see. What about Charles Oliveira? Because he doesn't have anything coming up, does he? That would be an interesting fight because I don't know. I would I think, say they have inter- similar I, styles, but they have, look, yeah, they're similar. I just think that the only, I just think that if you're, Tony Ferguson, you're 36 turning 37. You want a fight that's going to get you to the title shot. Yeah. Dustin Poirier is the fight to get you to the title shot. I agree. Right? I think I, a very risky fight for him as well. It is a risky fight, but I think, you know, Dustin Poirier, it's also a risky fight for Dustin Poirier, you know? Um, that's true. I, mean, I would take Ferguson in a Poirier fight personally. Um, I just I, think I, he's more diverse. He's, he's diverse, but he's shown his defensive liabilities, and especially against a southpaw like um, a, a, a tricky southpaw like Poirier, who's become not only very defensively sound, but, man, uh, just ha- has the – I don't know. It's tough. It's a tough matchup, to say the least. I think Jack, Poirier, Slack, Jack Slack says to, just, does, of Dustin Poirier, he does all these beautiful things ugly. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, honestly, I don't think you can make. Uh, okay, how about this? How about a Kevin Lee rematch? Um, I, I'd like to see more from Kevin Lee personally. Um, I just think you know, wait, when what was his last fight? Was it, it was still a that loss? Not... Okay. It was a loss to Charles Oliveira. Yeah. 
Mm. Yeah, probably Kevin Lee is a little bit too far down the ladder. But yeah. yeah, you can't make a you can't make an uninteresting fight with Tony at that weight class, I think. Do you guys like an Islam versus Tony matchup? Or is that no. I like it. I like it. I think matchmakers would struggle to make it because of uh, you know, their Islam ability to sell it. Yeah. Yeah, but I would like to see it. Um I think three, okay. four, like, look, on Tapology, Tony's at four, Dustin's at three. Why not? Let's do it. Yeah. So, yeah, Andrew, I, 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 I agree. I think that might be the matchup to make. Um, so this one comes from Julian Ibrahim, or as I call Julia Abraham, and he says, can you handle the Jewish jab and the Hebrew hook? What's the, I, I'm familiar with the Jewish jab, but what's the Hebrew hook? How are you familiar with the Jewish jab? Kidding, I don't know what <laughs> any of that means. What does it mean? <laughs> it is it is such an inside he's one of my students, right? Okay. It is just such a ridiculously inside joke that they're two of his techniques that he uses, the Jewish jab and the I'll say to him, I'll say to him, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, man, you cannot handle the Jewish jab nor the Hebrew hook, Michael. And and that's a fact. Julia <laughs> Abraham will K-O-T-F-C, king of the cage? No, not the, <laughs> you know, what out. Um, so, yeah, but moving on, moving on. I think we've got stupid Samsungs. <laughs> Tell me about it. Oh, by the way, if Samsung wants to sponsor a Samsung, you're so amazing. I Samsung, have your- Sam, we will literally drink your visceral fluids. Yes, we will poison <laughs> the mercury rivers for you. And, oh, sorry. <laughs> and this next one comes from Learn with Annabelle, and uh, she says, "David, you're gonna hate this one, as I do. On a scale of one to gay, how gay is it to be in another man's guard?" <laughs> she did not say that. There's no way she said. That. Do you want to bet? Do you want to? I I've met her like briefly, and like Ma- 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 Max's girl. You want you want to bet that's what she said? <laughs> I swear on my mother's life, that's what she asked. She said, on a scale of one to gay, how gay is sitting in another man's guard? Uh, I would say... I mean, I it's say, pretty gay, but it's also deadly. It depends on whether you have a boner and whether we're talking closed guard or butterfly guard. Because butterfly guard, you're trying to keep them off you. But closed guard, it's like, no, come on in, right? Legs are open. Legs are open. Come on in, right? I'll be real. I did my first... Uh jiu-jitsu session with michael the other day and i had no flexibility trying to keep uh his name's danny danny right yeah danny this I, I, I had no flexibility trying to keep danny in my guard so i was trying to like wrap my legs around like to, to keep him from like moving away and punching and like i had to do the gayest thing in the world <laughs> i had to like push my hips up and like spread my legs up but that's how you but that's how you keep guard. Like that's, that's really, like, like, guard. It's like, and, they, and they say black people aren't homophobic. Yeah, it's really, like so, it's so, it's so crazy how closely related uh, what uh, combat is to um, Sex. homosexual activity. Like, <laughs> and, and you know what? But you know what? There's not, there's just, like, just, there's like love, just like making just like making love, fighting is a dance. Just like yeah. making love, fighting yeah. is a dance. Damn, Jeremy! Jeremy out here. I th- Jeremy's going to attract some female followers to our podcast. Ladies, if you want Jeremy to make love to you, just send a slide into hey. our DMs. He'll give you that dance. There Jeremy, no Jeremy is Jeremy is well intertwined with the dance Stop, okay. of fight. Stop prostituting me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. Larry. Yeah. No, I was going to say you can't uh, spell BJJ without BJ. But people. <laughs> <laughs> For me, that BJ is black jokes. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> uh, right, so uh, this comes from future filmmaker, who is my friend Maria, who trains out at 6MMA under Danny Beauclair. And she says, when do we get to roll again? Um. I mean, Maria, if you want to roll with me personally, you know where I am. Good question, actually. But, Have you guys been rolling at your gym? Yeah, so uh, the way... Recently, the way, yeah. Recently. The, the, I, I, I'm teaching again, and the way Matador, the way we're doing it now... Um, is you have one partner, you get to pick that one partner and you got to stick with that partner in your little box, right? 
and you can, I'm out, out, out there instructing and everybody does the technique. And at the end you roll with just that partner. And obviously it's best to get as many rolls as possible, but for the circumstances, I think it's a really good compromise And they're They're also checking your temperature. When you walk in, wow. you fill out a bunch of forms, exit out the back door. You're not allowed to take any of your belongings in with you. So I think it's a pretty reasonable compromise for the situation we're in. Yeah. You got to be in there like changed already. And then you gotta leave. So, so Maria, I think it's, if you want to roll, get your ass in the gym. Right. Wait, can I call her the B word? No. Right. So no. never mind. Because well, I was yeah. going to say Maria, bring it again. I was going to say bring it again. The right. only B word you can call my friend Maria is a beautiful woman, and that is that is that is that is a fact. Yes. So you better. Uh, you better. The only B word we call Maria on this podcast is beautiful. Hilarious. At my yeah, gym. Bring it back. <laughs> gym, what we've been doing is just kind of solo sparring, I guess, with uh, bags. So uh, basically, like flow drills and stuff. Um, but yeah, at first I thought it was a little weird and how would it work long term. But I think we're also transitioning into the same system that you guys are doing in terms of um, Pick one creating guy. a partner and then being that that them being part of your social bubble and et cetera, et cetera. So you know what? It's interesting because I was I was I was wondering. I don't know if they're gonna do anything. I haven't talked to anybody. But national championships technically were supposed to be. November from Muay Thai. They're never good. That's not going to happen. You don't like, think it's going to happen? Almost definitely not. Almost definitely not. Away. We're two months away and COVID yeah. is slowly coming away, coming down. Like, there's no crowds. Yeah. So there's no I think problem. we got to ease. I think we got to ease into it. And I think something like a Jiu Jitsu tournament or Muay Thai nationals is really too many people in one space. Um, unless there's not going to be an audience. Yeah. I unless there's going to be an audience. Yeah. The, there wouldn't be an audience. There wouldn't I think be we're a little soon. close from that. We're a little, we're a little too, too, sorry, it's a little too soon. Yeah, I agree with David, but yes. um, we have, we have, we have one more question. It's from my Ukrainian brother, Mindaugas. And I'm sorry, my, what? Uh, who? Mindaugas. My dingus? Like, what? My dingus. <laughs> uh, my Ukrainian brother. And he says, and I'm going to read this in his accent. From which country fighter? You like to fight the least. So what he meant to say is what's what from what country would you want, least want to fight someone, a fighter from what country? I'll go first. Um, I, don't, I don't believe in countries. Um, I believe in city sovereign states. Uh, so I don't recognize any international borders. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> when did you become a right wing <laughs> lunatic? <laughs> when did you I have a lot of friends who are like that. They're just like, we need to get rid of all international borders. Every city is its own sovereign nation. Um, well, I think long term we need to obviously get become one united world. But this is this is this is not what we're talking about, okay, David? Um, I would say me personally, I'm gonna say Eastern Europeans in general, and I'll tell you why. Um, if you can find a very technical Eastern European fighter, they're scary. And not all of them are super technical. A lot of them, and don't take this as an insult, I'm Eastern European myself, at least half Eastern European. Um, a lot of their techniques are stuck in like 1996 of like, you know, their guard passing kind of sucks and they jump on, uh, you know, not very technical leg lock and end up on their back. A lot of like Sambo guys are like that. Mind you, um, with the new developments that are coming in in technique, I'll say one thing about these guys. They're ridiculously strong. They don't understand the meaning of the word quit. And they're they're crazy. So if you can find a very technical Eastern European, like I've had, I've had uh, this guy who came into my gym and I tore his ACL on a heel hook. And he looks at me, he's like, no, it's fine. He's fine. Let's keep going. Stands up to keep wrestling with me. And his entire knee slides out of place. So, um, yeah, they, there's something in the water over in that part of the world where they are just a terrifying breed. And if you can find an Eastern European fighter who's technical as well as has the standard lunacy that seems to be pervasive in that part of the world, like, count me out. <laughs> count, count me out. I'm good. What, what about the, you, Mike? Off the board, off the board, um, any, like, any African guy... I, I was gonna I, say, I, 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 my joke was gonna be, I hate fighting Ghanaians because I hate them. But sorry, go on. <laughs> no, but 
any any from, kind from, of from Guinea, African... from Guinea, from from New Guinea, no, from Ghana, like, specifically from Guinea, from... like Matt, like Mike and Jeremy from Guinea. Okay, go on. Yeah, I'm from Guinea, Guineans. Sorry, keep going on. Uh, Is it Ghanaians? Is it Ghanaians, David? It's Ghanaian. No. Ghanaian for sure. Ghanaian. It, it, sorry. It's, it's, well, Ghanaian is the British way of saying it, but it's Ganyan, if you want to say it correctly. And David is just mad because we don't. Well, David's work. pronunciation was the worst, but go on, go on, Mike. <laughs> no, no, okay, okay, but seriously, seriously. Um, I honestly, some of some of the most athletic people on earth, like they'll they'll be put, they'll be eating jollof rice all day and come into the gym and 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 be on the itis and still be just killing everything. Um, it's it's insane. And I'm, I say that as an African, having African in my blood, and knowing that I'm probably the least least athletic African of all the Africans. Oh, shut That's your mouth. Mike is, a, Mike is a freak athlete. No, not like uh, – I wouldn't not go like, that far. First of all, Christian Yaboa is a much better athlete. Yeah, than Mike is I. I would yeah. say a freak athlete. Like, yeah, yeah no. come on. No, I'm, I'm very unathletic in comparison. As a, as a, white, as a white guy – <laughs> with with yeah. no athleticism, I'm so sick. <laughs> Hilarious. But once again, not to circle back, but that's what I thought when I said uh, watch Randy Brown. I was like, this is clearly a dude who's walked into a gym, and they were like, yeah, we're going to – that's like a special kind of body type kind of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. No. There's loads of people like that, loads of people yeah. like that. I just – like, honestly, it's just tough because typically, like, again, I, I don't know what it is, but – I what I do is rhythm disruption and vision. Like I see things and I disrupt rhythm. It's hard to do that with African guys because they're just so much quicker, yeah. so much faster, so yeah. much more explosive. Yeah. You, so, you want to know? You want to know something funny? My friend Amir uh, Amir Bani, um, he he fought against an African guy in his last fight, and he ended up winning. He won. I think he, he TKO'd him. But he said, "I've never ran into someone so strong and athletic." Like he put this guy in neon belly, right? As you as you know, you guys know neon belly, right? Yeah, I just learned. Yes. <laughs> he put this guy in neon belly, and as you know, it's a miserable, miserable position. And um, lay there. <laughs> this guy, this guy hey, on the bottom, this African gentleman, just stands up. Like what? not not even <laughs> not even not even like does a technique. Like no, he just stands up. Like ha, ah, your jujitsu is not real. <laughs> just get up bro like there's something to that old, like tap out clad you know buffoon statements of just stand up i guess if you're african but um yeah man freak athleticism i, I will give you that for sure the shots are eastern european though that's a good shot no yeah they all know the meaning of quinn over at eastern european I feel just as tough and strong yeah strong and like the kind of athle- the kind of um, athleticism I feel with them is different from the kind of athleticism you would from an African gentleman. Like mm-hmm. with African gentlemen, it's like they're quick, they're explosive, they can generate an incredible amount of power. Not to get into those weird racial categories, but yeah, like with Eastern, with Eastern, awesome. with Eastern <laughs> European people, they have the strength where it's like yeah. this stable, they'll, like constant. Yeah, yeah. They'll cling onto your head, like they'll try some you know shitty headlock takedown that's not going to work. And managed to get you into some kind of scarfold. And instead of being able to pop out and take their back like you should be able to, they hold on to your head for like 10 minutes straight with this unrelenting squeeze, you know? So, <laughs> man. Sounds fun. Right. Can't yeah. wait to start rolling. All right. <laughs> it's time for Africa. Yeah. Okay. No. Oh my God. That was one of the darkest <laughs> moments in African history. <laughs> that was. Um, that was the. Oh problem. man. Shakira song. Get into the handball. That like. Also, I wanted to say. Literally cry. Shouts uh, out to Stefano's students who are having their ACLs torn when rolling with him. Like. Oh no no. no I know was, the guy. I know the no, guy. No, no. That guy was. That guy was not my student who's ACL oh, okay. torn. <laughs> that guy was a, a nice guy, but trying to. Flex. You ever, you, yeah, you ever roll with someone? Like, he didn't sub me or anything, but he's, you know, I'm just having a nice, comfortable roll. And the guy's trying to tear off my limbs. I'm like, dude, relax. So when I, when I got that heel hook, I just kind of looked him in the eyes. And I'm like, okay, it's over. You know, I'm not going to crank this any further, but I'm not letting go either. And the guy runs in the wrong direction out of the heel hook. And I just hear oh. a sound. Like, like, literally, there's a right way and a wrong way. The wrong way is going into the pressure of the heel hook. Yeah. yeah, you're supposed to go towards the pressure, not away from it, because then you're you're turning your yeah. shin 
and your theme are in opposite directions. And he does that, and I just hear the sound like a bunch of twigs snapping, like a, and I'm like, this is your own damn fault, man. Why? <laughs> you're, not, you're so proud that you can't tap, but yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Sorry, sorry, long rant. I rip, I rip my knee up before I tap a bitch. <laughs> All right. I'll test that when we roll next, Mike. No, no, no. I'm good, though. Yeah, <laughs> no. <we're fine>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a okay. Oh, man. All right. Oh, Did we want to get point. into our basketball our basketball stories, Mike, before we finish off or no? Uh, we're an hour and 49 minutes in. Um, but why not? Why not? Cause we're mine's, here. Really, mine's super quick. Okay. No, super quick. I was in Mexico at the resort. And then the Raptors were playing the Philadelphia 76ers in round two of the NBA playoffs, right? And I think it was game one. And the Raptors ended up winning by, what was it? Some some insane number, like 22 or something like that in that game one. And, yeah, like throughout the entire game in Mexico, even the Mexicans were going, let's go Raptors. And then you just hear a, Let's go Raptors. It was kind of crazy. And then, like, literally for game two, someone gave me this nice, like, Raptors flag that I have hanging here and a whole bunch of stuff because they worked at a bar in Canada, which is kind of cool. The Raptors are an international team. Let's go Raptors. Yeah, that was... We're uh, on team. I, I would say that was a good story. No. But it wasn't a good story. In fact, no. I don't even know if I could call it a story. Because not, it wasn't a story. It, wasn't. It, lacked, it lacked some of the essential components of a story, like a plot. And I, I, had I, had to I had to We're an hour and 49 in. I had to oh, sure, so sure. Here's, here's, a, here's a funny story, if you can call it that. When I was in Cuba, there were these uh, Russian gentlemen, really like straight from Russia, that we would party with every night. And we had... One, we had one black friend with us, our friend Ty. Uh, and Ty, you know, he's a tall, athletic-looking black guy. And so these these Russian guys keep coming up to him every day, and they just be like, hey, you know, basketball, basketball, eh, you know. There's this one guy in particular, you know, hey, you know, uh, Michael Jackson, dance like uh, Michael Jackson. We're like, ah, yeah, yeah. And it was every time where it's like, eventually it dawned. He's like, you want to play basketball? Well, yeah, let's play basketball. It dawned on us. We start calling him basketball Russian. And then all of a sudden it, it hit us. We're like, oh, my God. This guy's never seen a black person before. Like, he's he's lived in Russia his whole life, and he's never seen a black person. So he was just so fascinated by our friend Ty. And he finally did get to play basketball with Ty at the end, which was which was nice. Um, obviously, got smoked. But so his, his, only, his, his only cultural reference points for black people were basketball and Michael Jackson. Hilarious. And that reminds me of when Michael and I did the last Kobe Bryant episode. Oh, yeah, it's lost in the annals of history. We made that point about how basketball is this huge. And, like, for a lot of people, basketball stars are the most popular black people out there. So um, that's what they are. I am so sad that that episode is lost in the annals of history. Yeah, we murked that, too. We murked that also, man. We had, like, an impassioned, like, discussion of what it means to be a black man growing up, like we killed that, <laughs> and it's lost forever. <laughs> it's gone. I, Stefano, you remember the day before, right? When you know the news came that Kobe died, and remember, I needed like ten minutes because I couldn't. Like, I, I don't know why. I actually don't know why this day, but I needed time before I could go back in. Wow. It was like losing somebody. I remember so, that. Yeah, I remember that very yeah, well. It was so. All you right. know, for them to us do that tribute for Kobe Bryant and then it being lost. I actually kind of broke my heart a little bit. but For me, I, I can imagine, because for me, it was like the day that Jeffrey Epstein died. Just a no. tragic... Oh, no. And with Don't that, do that. Don't do that. <laughs> okay, and that's where we end the podcast. Yeah, really. That's where we... That's okay. where the podcast... Guys, in this crazy, messed up world where Stefano's threatening you, threatening to come in and take your life and your ACLs if you don't listen to the podcast where where David, you know, is spitting his, his feminist literature, his, his his feminist slam poetry where Jeremy can't even keep us keep awake because he just had, you know, a bunch of jollof rice and some fried chicken, you know. In this crazy world where Michael Asifo, you know, is not athletic somehow, some some way, you have three things. You have 
family, friendship, and you have Jeffrey Epstein. Stephano. Oh my god. Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. We we're we're going to be calling you Stefano Epstein from now on. Moving forward. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, I, li- I like it. I like Stepstein. Stepstein. Ring to it. Stepstein. <laughs> <laughs> right. Good night, everybody. Okay. Bye.